In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes. Tonight on Primetime, a concerning new study showing the rate of COVID-19 infections in children rose dramatically at the end of July. What it means to children as they head back to school. Plus, just two days before kids start virtual learning, Gwinnett County is responding to tech issues that left some families shut out of the system. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. First tonight, new concerns about children going back to school during the pandemic. A study from the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Children's Hospital Association shows COVID-19 cases in children rose 40% in the last half of January. That means they now make up 8.8% of total cases. The study considered data from 49 states, although the age range for who was considered a child was different from state to state. The findings contradict President Trump's recent claims that children are essentially immune to the virus, and the study comes as many parents are sending their children back into the classroom here in Georgia. Now a state representative is offering an outlet so students and teachers can share concerns without fear of retribution. Here's Tracy A. McPhear with more. I am planning for 27 students in my tiny classroom. They are not making masks mandatory. My principal is joking to people that this is God's cleansing plan. I'm a type 1 diabetic. I'm incredibly fearful and couldn't sleep last night because I feel as if I may be exposed today. State Representative Beth Moore says so far she's received more than 200 whistleblower emails from teachers and students across Georgia. Our superintendent seems to take the hold your nose and close your eyes and hope for the best approach. We have no real backup plan for when this all hits the fan. Moore says she started this project after Hannah Waters was suspended from North Paulding High School for posting a picture online of crowded hallways with no masks and no social distancing. It wasn't until days later, amid outrage online, that the school dropped the punishment. When a student tries to do the right thing to keep people safe and she gets punished as a result, that's not the type of world that I want to live in. Moore says this is a way for students and teachers to speak up without any backlash. She is keeping their names anonymous, but shared some of their claims. Every class I teach has 30 or 31 students. We start on Thursday. There is no way we can socially distance with that many kids in one class. Like this email from a teacher in Forsyth County. We asked Forsyth County about it. There are some situations where they will have up to the full class size. The district says masks are not mandated, but encouraged. Everyone has a mask. The schools have spirit masks. Moore says most teachers who emailed were most concerned students wouldn't wear masks or that they didn't have the right cleaning supplies. I have numerous emails from teachers who have been told that if they're not happy with the conditions at the school, that their only option is to quit. Today, after one week of in-person learning, students in Paulding County attended class online. The district moved to virtual learning today and tomorrow after nine people at North Paulding High School tested positive for COVID-19. The principal says they were all in the building at some point last week. Now, this is the same school now famous for that viral photo Hannah Waters shared of packed hallways. 
She and another student were suspended for sharing pictures of what the school was like that first week. Those suspensions have since been lifted. Now we asked how she felt to be moving online. If they had delayed school like other counties are doing, they could have had this time to think it through to make a plan that could have lasted a lot longer than this one. So we could have not just been shoved into the school as guinea pigs. We also caught up with a woman who says her nephews are two of the students who tested positive at North Paulding High. She says they're doing well, but that doesn't ease her concerns. They've both been home all week. They have both, they're both feeling much better. However, <laughs> who knows who they infected on Monday when they were at school all day long with no mask. Honestly, I would wish that they would just go virtual. The superintendent says parents will know by Tuesday night when kids will be able to return to class. Meanwhile, Gwinnett County is dealing with some technical issues as kids get ready to start virtual learning in just two days. Spokesperson confirms that while some families could access the online portal during a tech check today, others could not log in at all. They say they are still looking why. But right now, the portal is backed up and functioning, and they will continue to check it and make adjustments ahead on Wednesday. Tonight, the state's working to curb the high infection rate in Clayton County. It's more than double the overall state rate. They're opening a new mega testing site that's near Hartsfield Jackson Airport to get a better handle on the problem. And as Joe Hankey reports, it will only be open for 12 days. At 9 a.m. this morning, an airport parking lot in Clayton County became a drive through testing site. Right here in Clayton County, we're seeing one of the highest positivity rates in the state at around 20%. That is unacceptable, and that is why today is so important. Governor Brian Kemp says as of Sunday, the statewide rate for tests coming back positive was 8.2%. This testing site is the result of a federal and state partnership. The goal is to provide surge testing in Clayton County with up to 5,000 people tested per day over the next 12 days. The free testing is open to any Georgia resident, regardless of symptoms. After 12 days of surge testing, U.S. Surgeon General Jerome Adams wants state health officials to decide if the site is still needed. Public health measures precede cases, which precede hospitalizations and deaths. So uh, you might not see deaths or hospitalizations come down in 12 days, but we would like to see positivity rates start to come down and cases start to come down. If we don't see these things, then I think it's appropriate to reassess and figure out, do we need to keep the site open a little longer? Adams said health officials are also focused on quickly turning around test results from this site. Test that takes two weeks to get back is of, is of limited utility in terms of isolation and contact tracing. State health officials quoting a two to three day turnaround time for this site so people can quickly know whether they need to isolate or not in an area outpacing the rest of the state for positive cases. Dr. Adams and the whole team at the federal government felt like this was a good area to target. You were telling me that y'all have done this in five or six other states. This will just bring that two-week capacity to really put a focus on this. The Surgeon General says that Georgia cannot test its way out of the pandemic, even with increased test, uh, testing in Clayton County, wearing masks, hand washing, social distancing all remain very important. We have information on this site's exact location in hours and a link to register all inside this story right now over on 11alive.com. The pandemic has become a partisan issue all over the country, and our new 11 Alive poll shows that is certainly the case here in Georgia as well. 11 Alive's Doug Richards is looking into the numbers. From the job President Trump and Governor Kemp are doing handling the pandemic to the question of whether schools should have in-person classes or not, Georgia Democrats and Georgia Republicans mostly disagree. Do you approve of how President Trump has handled the coronavirus? Your party affiliation may guide the answer. In 11 Alive's poll of 800 Georgians, 86% of Republicans said they approve of Trump's handling of the pandemic. 82% of Democrats said they disapprove. Even on questions of trust, the divide is strong. Asked to weigh the trustworthiness of President Trump or Dr. Anthony Fauci, 61% of Republicans said they trust President Trump. 73% of Democrats said Dr. Fauci. On the question of schools, voters in both parties support a hybrid approach with classes online and in person, but 26% of Republicans and only 7% of Democrats supported in-person only classes. 21% of Democrats supported keeping schools closed compared to 7% of Republicans. Politics also shapes the response of Georgians to Governor Brian Kemp's executive orders to control the pandemic. 
74% of Republicans said they approve or strongly approve of Kemp's performance. 75% of Democrats said they disapprove or strongly disapprove. The divide is not helping, says Republican former state representative Buzz Brockway. I think that is hampering us. We, we should, this should be something, a crisis should be something that brings us all together, but it's not. It's uh, forcing us uh, into our camps. The Secret Service was forced to shoot a person outside of the White House momentarily during President Trump's daily coronavirus briefing. And the Dow, Dow Jones, are going to be, I mean, the way they're going, it looks like they're just about going to be topping records, hopefully soon. Excuse me? A Secret Service agent rushing the president out of the briefing room to the Oval Office. Reporters then looking out the windows, appearing to be ever vigilant, then turning back around and it resumes. The president confirmed with those reporters that the Secret Service fired a weapon at an armed person outside the White House fence. President Trump says that person now is in a local hospital. Seems to be very he well did address uh, that moment Service as soon as he came back. Uh, just told me when he came up, you pretty much saw it like I did. He said, sir, could you please come with me? So you were surprised. I was surprised also. I think it's probably pretty unusual. But uh, very, very professional people. They do a fantastic job, as you know. So we don't know exactly what the person was doing. Obviously, he was armed. So uh, we'll continue to have an update on that as soon as we get more information. All right, let's get you caught up now on some other big headlines we've been following for you this evening. A man is now behind bars after a two year old boy accidentally shot himself in the head in northwest Atlanta. Atlanta police telling us the boy was left alone at a home on Delray Drive Saturday morning when he found a gun and shot himself. The two year old still in critical condition. Dontavious Wells, who was supposed to be watching the boy, is charged with child cruelty and firearm possession by a convicted felon. In Lamar County, a deputy is recovering after authorities say he was ambushed. The sheriff's office says Deputy Justin Weaver was responding to reports of a suspicious person Saturday night. They say he was sitting in his patrol car when the suspect ambushed him with a shotgun. Pellets hit him in the face and arm, but he is expected to survive. The suspect, Donald Gordy, got away but was later arrested in Alabama. We are told investigators found weapons inside his truck. One of the country's biggest meal kit companies is coming to Georgia and bringing 750 jobs. HelloFresh is opening a distribution center in Noonan. It's the company's first center in the southeast as it expands. In the past year, the company has doubled its customer base. Traffic stop in South Georgia getting attention from the NAACP. An officer fired at a car. There were children inside. The latest on the investigation coming up. And don't forget, we are streaming right now on our 11 Alive YouTube channel. You can subscribe and join the conversation there in the community section. There's more 11 Alive news in primetime after this break. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. 
on 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. A teenager accused of killing a man inside a Gwinnett County business has now been named as a person of interest in another case where a high school grad was killed. 18-year-old Joshua Brandt was arrested on Saturday. Police say on Friday he showed up at a business in Gwinnett County on Satellite Boulevard and just opened fire, killing 38-year-old James Ross. Police told us they believe Ross was targeted, but they have not said why. Today they named Brandt as a person of interest in the stabbing death of Slade Petty. Petty was killed two weeks ago at an apartment on McGinnis Ferry, a couple of miles away from Friday's crime scene. His murder is the first in Sewanee in over a decade. Police say that Petty and Brant knew each other, but they haven't offered a motive or said how this case could be tied to uh, by Friday's actions. According to a GoFundMe Petty's family has set up, uh, he had graduated from North Gwinnett High School, his mother telling us he never would hang up the phone without saying that he loved her. If you know anything, there is $10,000 out there and a reward offered in this case. A Georgia family is demanding answers after a police officer fired shots at a car with children inside on Saturday in South Georgia. The GBI is investigating what happened during that chaotic traffic stop, which has since gained attention from the Georgia NAACP. Blaine Alexander reports. This, what they saw that, bro. this video shows the chaotic aftermath of a confrontation between South Georgia police and a car full of minors. They're shooting at them. For what? You know the kids. You see their kids and you still shooting? State officials are investigating what led up to an officer firing repeatedly at the vehicle. These are kids. These are minors. According to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, a Waycross police officer tried to get license plate information on the car. Three minors, ages 9, 12, and 14, got out and ran. When a second officer came to help, the GBI says the car drove toward that officer who started shooting. My little sister's going to be remembered running from the police and falling in the grass of her own yard and almost getting shot. Inside the car, a 15 and 16 year old, both facing charges, including driving without a license, aggravated assault on an officer, and both charged with weapons possession. Their father told a local station the gun was in the glove compartment and registered to their mother. Those are the children, man! Now the local NAACP is demanding release of the police body camera and dash cam video. The most concerning aspect is a nine-year-old and a 12-year-old were subject to having guns fired in their presence or around them. Uh, and so our concern is the level of force that was used. The GBI says no officers were injured and two have been placed on administrative leave. So far, the GBI has investigated 59 officer-involved shootings in Georgia this year, including four this weekend alone. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. It was an active afternoon out there today with a line of showers and thunderstorms that moved through. Some of those were severe. We have numerous reports of damage left behind with some trees down thanks to those gusty winds. The good news is all of that activity has pushed well down to the south right now, and it looks like it's going to remain a rather quiet night. Now we're all, we are watching another area of rain and thunderstorms up in Tennessee that will move into North Alabama a little bit later later on tonight and even parts of North Georgia might see a couple of these showers later on. However, we don't expect them to be strong here. That's thanks to the rain that came through earlier that really stabilized our atmosphere and cooled things down a little bit by two in the morning. Yeah, maybe just a few light showers over North Georgia, but again, we don't think that'll be strong. Any of that falls apart before it gets to the metro Atlanta area and we will start off the day, the day dry tomorrow. Maybe a little bit of fog in some spots where we had some of that heavier rain today with that higher moisture content in the air. Now look what happened to the temperatures. We actually got up into the mid 90s today before the rain came in and then once the rain moved in those temperatures started falling as it was nearing and then once the rain hit uh, Hartsfield that's when those temperatures dropped very quickly back into the 70s and we're pretty much going to be holding into the 70s during the rest of the evening hours tonight and we start off in the morning at 72 then it warms up again. We get up to 92 degrees in the afternoon. That's going to be enough heating and we'll have enough moisture in the atmosphere for that heat to help bubble up some of those scattered showers. The rain chance at about 40%. On our scale from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day, we're going to go with a 6 on the wasometer. So here's what we're watching. Those storms down to the south will continue to push away. We'll be dry here at 10 o'clock, but again, 
watching some of those showers up in Tennessee and North Alabama uh, as they try to move into Georgia. They're going to weaken as they hit that cooler and more stable air in the morning. A dry start here, maybe a little bit of fog around at lunchtime, a mixture of sunshine and clouds. But then once we get into those later afternoon hours, you've got that heating here with us. That'll give us some of the scattered showers that'll pop up. Maybe some uh, thunder and lightning with that even into the evening hours that dies out late evening and then by Wednesday morning it's a dry start at lunchtime. We're still dry, but once we get into the later afternoon hours, there will be a chance for some of those scattered showers. We're going to go with a 40% chance for that both Tuesday and Wednesday, and we still think high temperatures will get into the lower 90s for Tuesday and Wednesday. Thursday and Friday, that's when the rain chances are going to be a little bit higher at 60%. And with the additional clouds and with the higher rain chances, those temperatures will hold, we think, into at least the upper 80s, right about 89 Thursday, 88 on Friday. And then once we see those higher rain chances for the end of the week, they come back down a little bit Saturday to 40%, 30% on Sunday. So they don't totally go away, but at least they're a little bit lower. And then the rain, the, uh, rain chances go down to 20% on Monday. But with that, temperatures back up into the lower 90s. Students leaving for college have a few extra items to pack this year to help combat the coronavirus, experts say. In addition to the essentials, only bring what you'll need for the first few months of the year. Dan Sheneman has the details. As college students head to campus this fall, there are new essential items that need to be added to those packing lists. Which is a whole different perspective with the pandemic. Bloggers Anne-Marie Cristiano and Ann Zirkel of Simply Two Moms help families navigate these uncharted waters. You want to have a bag that's already sort of pre-packed, you can grab and go. Melanie Berlier of the spruce.com echoes the suggestion of a COVID go bag. You want to include extra cleaning supplies, hand sanitizer, a thermometer, additional face masks, and rubber gloves. And a second bag for items that can't be packed in advance. Like your laptop, your laptop charger, your phone charger, toothbrush, <laughs> toiletries, right. those kinds of things. Yeah. Experts say pack extra of the essentials. You can't on being able to pick up whatever you want at a moment's notice these days. If your student buys items online, check where they are delivered to avoid carrying heavy boxes across campus. Every college campus is different about where they um, get their mm. packages delivered. And make sure your student is prepared with a list of emergency contact numbers. Print it out, laminate it, put it on a card, pin it to your wall, do what you have to do. Don't forget the basics, like a good set of sheets, towels, bathrobe, even a weighted blanket. Decor might need to take a back seat this semester. This is the year to pair down a little. Just in case the semester is cut short by the coronavirus. After the break, our Why Guy explains why some kids have such a hard time when it comes to wearing a mask and what parents can do to make it a little bit easier. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all. The COVID-19 pandemic has made masks a part of our daily wardrobe, and as children head back to school, many have struggled. But why is wearing a mask so difficult for them, and what can you as parents do? Here's our Y guy, Jerry Carnes. Halloween is an occasion when you expect to see children in masks. You don't expect it day after day. For many youngsters, a face covering can be far more than just uncomfortable. A lot of children are afraid of masks. Let's explore why young children have difficulty with masks and what parents can do to help. Adults can find masks uncomfortable, but we understand the need in the COVID-19 era. Dr. Joanna Dolgoff is a pediatrician who says children can't make that leap. Children cognitively can't understand the importance of wearing a mask. It doesn't feel good, it's uncomfortable, they can't breathe, it's claustrophobic. That's all they know. They don't like it and they want it off. Youngsters rely on a smile or a familiar face to feel safe. When that's covered, they can grow uneasy. They're actually scared of them, but there are things that we can do as parents to help them get over this fear. For example, both you and your child wearing masks together while in front of a mirror. You can also put a mask on your child's favorite stuffed animal, or you can draw in a mask on your child's favorite storybook character. Introduce the mask slowly. Practice, practice, practice with your child. Sit with them in the mask for a few minutes. The next day, sit a few minutes longer. Dr. Dolgoff says some children will take to them right away. Others need more time to understand we live in an era when masks are not just for Halloween. If you have a question for Jerry Carnes, our why guy, you can send it to us on Facebook, Twitter, or by email. So to come in prime time, she has been struggling to pay the bills for months because of the pandemic. But after we shared her story, the support came pouring in. We'll have an update on the Mayweather family coming up. Living Alive Today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station.
today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive. The number of new coronavirus cases continues to fall in Georgia, a trend highlighted by the governor today. Sadly, though, we are still seeing high numbers of deaths. Today, the Department of Public Health reported 30 more people in our state have died. Reveal investigator Rebecca Lindstrom looks at some of the numbers behind the heartache. The number of new cases may be trending down, but every organization that tracks COVID's impact still has Georgia in the red. That means this virus is not under control and is spreading through every age group in every part of the state. Just look at the number of people who died in the past two weeks in the four largest metro counties. Gwinnett and Fulton lead the way with more than 50 each. And these four counties alone make up nearly a quarter of the 758 people who died with COVID since the end of July. The other 75% are scattered throughout the state. The Department of Public Health doesn't separate white from Latino people in its data, but together they make up the largest number of people who died, 364 in the past two weeks. Black people made up 270 of those deaths and 10 people were of Asian descent. As of July 31st, our team at the Georgia Department of Community Health has surveyed 100%, 100% of our skilled nursing facilities for compliance with infection control measures. Today, the governor proudly discussed the state's efforts to curb the virus's spread in our long-term care facilities. That's a positive step, but in the past two weeks, 277 people still died in our nursing homes. That's more than a third of our deaths. While those 60 and older remain the greatest at risk for severe complications, more than half of those who died in this age group were not living in nursing homes. They were a part of our general population. Thanks to increased testing, we're catching asymptomatic people faster. But 20% of those who need intense medical treatment are still dying. When you simply look at the total loss of life, the numbers are growing. From an average of 16 people every day at the beginning of July to 50 people right now. President Trump receiving criticism tonight from Democrats after a series of executive orders addressing the country's economic crisis. The orders include a new weekly unemployment bonus payment of $400. That's less than the $600 that people who were initially receiving. Another major highlight is a suspension of payroll taxes for people making less than $100,000 a year. The deferred tax would still be owed next year unless Congress agrees to waive it. That tax money funds Social Security and Medicare, but the president promises this won't impact Social Security. Democrats in Congress are criticizing the president's negotiators after talks of another relief bill fell apart last week. We said to the president, uh, to the president's negotiators uh, last week, we'll meet you in the middle. Right. We'll cut a trillion, you raise a trillion. You know what they said? Absolutely not. I said to them, you mean it's your way or the highway? And they said, yep. Since the economic crisis began, uh, began, we have turned to financial analyst Andrew Polis to answer your questions and to get an idea about what all these changes mean for the everyday person. We asked him whether the president has the power to make these moves. The president has the National Emergencies Act, which gives him a roughly about 136 statutory powers where he can sidestep Congress on this. Uh, I personally think the con that the president has uh, pulled a political move here to get Congress to act and do something. Uh, if you notice that the unemployment benefits and everything under this executive order is to begin in September. So we're in second week of August, I think, between now and the end of August. I think the president's using this as a strategy to be able to get both Republicans and Democrats in Congress to act and do something for the American people. We also asked him about this unemployment benefit boost of $400 per week. A $100 chunk of that is supposed to come from the states. Andrew says this may not be a long-term solution. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of states who are uh, having budget issues, uh, budget constraints. Um, so I don't think that 
as it stands now. This is more what the president has done, if it uh, works, is going to be more of a Band-Aid, not a permanent solution. A permanent solution and permanent law is going to have to come from Congress, so they're going to have to act. Uh, there's roughly about somewhere 44 to $50 billion uh, allocated for this extension of the unemployment at the $400 a week rate, which is not going to last for probably more than a few weeks. The other executive orders include an effort to halt evictions and to suspend, uh, suspend student loans. President Trump says he is open to more talks with the Democrats on these issues. The unemployment rate for black Americans is stuck at a staggering 14.6%, much higher than the overall rate. And then one Atlanta mother is still struggling to make ends meet months into this pandemic. NBC's Steve Patterson spoke with her. Every day, Kenesha Mayweather inches closer to her breaking point. The only currency she has in abundance right now, faith. I do a lot of praying. I, I think about my kids. They need me. I've broke down plenty of nights thinking, what am I going to do? We first profiled Mayweather back in June when black Americans were facing their highest unemployment rate in a decade. Mayweather, who lives in Atlanta, felt forced to quit her job in April, afraid of exposing her three children to COVID. I feel sad because I can't provide for my kids like I normally would. Mayweather's eldest daughter diagnosed with a rare form of cancer, her youngest breathing problems. If I don't have to take them out, I will not take them out. And just last week, another devastating blow. Right now, I just received the email that I was getting my last check. That additional $600 the federal government had given to unemployed Americans like Mayweather, gone. Don't know how I'm going to continue to pay my bills. I'm going to have to borrow, I guess, and hopefully everything gets paid. 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks, and ever since NBC Nightly News first shared this story, we have been flooded with emails asking how people can support, help out that Mayweather family. Well, there is a GoFundMe you can donate to. The family was only asking for $2,000, just enough to pay off bills. But as of today, the community has really stepped up to help them out. They have raised more than $13,000. Wow. So many people are encouraging the Mayweather family to stay strong and not to give up, and hopefully, this helps them get out of that difficult spot that they're in. It's a great story. Let's mm -hmm. hope they continue to raise that money. Soon, college presidents across America will have to make a decision about fall sports. Right now, the future of college football is unclear, but many players are making their voices heard and unifying behind one message. Here's Alex Glaze with our report. We want to play. As the 2020 fall college football season hangs in the balance, Clemson quarterback Trevor Lawrence ended a tweet with those four words Sunday night, and it quickly transformed into a movement. It's great to see somebody stand up and lead on behalf of the student athletes. I've seen Trevor Lawrence, who's probably one of, if not the best college football player in America, to stand up and really rally the troops and say, guys, listen to what we're saying. We're the ones who are playing the game and we want to play. Later in a tweet, Lawrence posted a statement attributed to representatives of the players of the Power Five conferences calling on the conferences to take certain actions to make football this fall feasible. Most notably, the players called for a college football players association. We're talking about players becoming employees, right? And, and so there's a lot of kind of unintended consequences that come with that. But I think if it's led by smart people, the right people, um, you know, people that understand kind of how collegiate finances work and, and, and what, you're, what you're getting into if you decide to unionize, then yeah, I think it could work. President Trump quote tweeted Lawrence's post and added, the student athletes have been working too hard for their season to be canceled. Hashtag, we want to play. All right, the pandemic has taken a toll on the Braves. According to our partners at the Atlanta Business Chronicle, the team lost 95% of its revenue in the second quarter of this year. To give you a better idea, that's $11 million in revenue compared to the $208 million the team made during the same time last year. The Braves still have more than $700 million in debt to pay off for developments in and around the battery. In June, Major League Baseball clubs were allowed to start furloughing or reducing pay for some workers. And since April, the company that provides food and drinks at the games has furloughed more than 1,000 employees. With the United States passing 5 million COVID-19 cases, new research is shining a light 
on the window in which people can spread the virus and how dangerous that can be for large gatherings. diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory disease. The United States has now surpassed 5 million cases of COVID-19, and that is more than any other country in the world by far. Now new research is shining a light on how massive gatherings can contribute to the spread of the virus. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has more on what some researchers now think is a short but potentially disastrous window of time. This morning, growing concern over potential super spreading events, which may be fueling a dramatic spike in coronavirus cases. <laughs> Tensions boiling over outside a church in Ventura County, California, where pro mass demonstrators had gathered. Godspeed Calvary Chapel defying statewide orders with indoor services. Now you get a chance to greet one another, uh, you know, however you like. There's freedom. Say hello. In Sturgis, South Dakota, a 10 day motorcycle rally that's expected to draw up to a quarter million people is still underway. All the other bike shows have been canceled nationwide. No masks required. To me, uh, a, a little bit frightening. Dr. Joshua Schiffer is with the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. He and his colleagues published a paper that's not been peer reviewed, but it found that coronavirus super spreading events are the result of the right people at the wrong place at the wrong time. 10 to 20 percent of people are responsible for about 80 percent of the infections. Then there are these less common but extremely important events where one person can infect dozens and sometimes over a hundred people. According to a model his team built, the riskiest window for transmission may be very brief, just a one or two day period in the week after a person is infected. 
but that window could be a huge problem if the person happens to be surrounded by crowds. The most obvious thing is you would try to prevent an unnecessary congregation of people in a tight environment. With the U.S. topping 5 million cases, these five states combined now make up more than 40 percent of the infections. In Chicago, beaches remain closed, but dozens gathered on one over the weekend anyway. You know, that picture was, I think, horrifying to many people uh, standing here. Researchers say the virus can still spread outside of that short window. So Dr. Schiffer says people shouldn't let up on wearing a mask or in social distancing as well. But the longer an infection drags on, the less likely a person is to be contagious. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. Most of those showers and storms have pushed well down to the south. But look at this. We're watching some showers and storms up in Tennessee that are nearing northwest Georgia this evening. The good news is as those move closer to us, they're going to hit the drier air and more stable and cooler air that we have over north Georgia right now. And we think they'll be weakening. Now, some of those will hold together in north Atlanta or north Alabama. But when those move into north Georgia, they'll be a little bit weaker, maybe just just a few spotty showers around during the overnight hours, but everything falls apart before it makes it to Atlanta. We will wake up in the morning to some patchy fog in some areas that won't be widespread, but just in those spots that had the heavier rain out there today, there is the chance for some fog to develop tomorrow in the morning. Temperatures are going to be mild at 72. Then it warms up again to 92 in the afternoon with that sunshine. Uh, and the cloud mixing together with the humidity around and the heating. We'll have a few of those scattered showers redevelop at about a 40% chance for that. And we'll give that a six on the wasometer. That's our scale from one to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. So watch those showers and storms tonight on the south side move away. The ones to the north and west of us also weakening before they move into our area. Maybe just a few spotty showers in northwest Georgia overnight. We start off with a little bit of fog here, but then in the afternoon, a mixture of sunshine and clouds at lunchtime. Late afternoon, that's when these scattered showers are going to be redeveloping once again. Some of these showers could have some heavy rain with them, thunder and lightning. That sticks with us for the early part of the evening hours, and then it diminishes. And then on Wednesday, uh, mostly sunny skies to start, and then at lunchtime still looking good. This model not showing a big chance for rain in the afternoon Wednesday. I'm going to hold on to a 40% chance for that. Uh, and then we're also watching out in the Atlantic a potential tropical system that the Hurricane Center is keeping an eye on. We're going to watch these spaghetti model plots because it's still going to have a long way to go to cross through the Atlantic. And then once we get into day five, six, and seven, that's when the models diverge a little bit. I just want to let you know it is too early to know whether or not this system, number one, is going to be a tropical storm. If it is, the next name on the list is Josephine. But then if it's even going to make it to the uh, southeastern coastline or even up into the Gulf of Mexico. So we just don't know that yet. Just know we're going to continue to watch it. In fact, remember, we've had a lot of activity this year. We've gone, gone through Isaias so far. The next name on the list is Josephine and then Kyle. If we run out of names on the list for this year, uh, if we have too much activity, we run out of names, then we will go to the Greek alphabet after that to name the storms after Wilfred. Let's hope we don't get to that. We normally peak uh, in the middle, uh, like September 10th is the statistical peak of hurricane season. So here we are mid-August. That's when things are really ramping up. We get to that peak before it goes back down. So this is the busy time of year. We'll keep a close eye on it for you. 40% chance for showers Tuesday and Wednesday with highs still in the 90s. Rain chance high Thursday and Friday at 60% and that might keep those high temperatures lower into the upper 80s and then the rain chances down a little bit Saturday at 40% 30% on Sunday and then even lower chances Monday a 20% chance for showers with highs in the lower 90s. Because of the coronavirus pandemic, many people are looking to vote by mail in the upcoming election. November 3rd is approaching very quickly, so Francis Abbey put together some tips on how to vote by mail and make it count. Want to vote by mail? Here's what you need to know. Most states are looking to make it easier to vote by mail this year due to the coronavirus. There are currently five states that conduct all elections by mail, Colorado, Hawaii, Oregon, Washington, and Utah. For these elections, all registered voters receive a ballot in the mail. The voter marks the ballot, puts it in a secrecy envelope, and then into a separate mailing envelope. They sign an affidavit on the outside of the mailing envelope and either mail it in or drop it off. If you don't live in one of these states, you can go to vote.org, which will help guide you through the process. Here are five tips to get you started. First, 
Make sure you're registered to vote. Not sure? You can check if and where you're registered on vote.org. If you're not registered, you can register there. Next, if you want to guarantee your vote by mail, request a mail-in ballot. Now, every state's rules are different, so vote.org can guide you to your state's website. Deadlines for mail-in ballots to be returned also vary by state, and they vary a lot. Some states need to receive your ballots by election day. In other states, your ballot needs to be postmarked by election day. So make sure to check your state on vote.org. You should request your mail-in ballot well before election day. The Postal Service recommends 15 days round trip to receive it and send it back. Some states are reporting delays with the Postal Service, so the earlier, the better. Finally, you have the right to vote. If anyone tries to stop you, call the Election Protection Hotline at 1-866-687-8683. Our Decision 2020 political team is covering the issues that matter most to you this election cycle, like health care and the economy. If you have something you'd like for us to cover, just send us an email at whereatlspeaks at 11alive.com. Well, a little bit of a legacy disappearing from at least Atlanta's, oh, I don't know, a good way to describe this, Ted Turner's footprints kind of disappearing this summer. We'll talk about that coming up. From 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknight. I wrote a little piece about Ted Turner's name sort of disappearing this summer from Atlanta on my Facebook page. Sitting around watching TV last night and slapped it on around midnight. I've got about 52,000 views on this thing right now. Ted Turner's name still resonates around here. But Turner Field is no more. Even when it wasn't, it is. Does that make sense? You drive by Turner Field, do you think of it as Georgia State Stadium? No, you don't. You think of Turner Field and, 
and the uh, the millions upon millions of baseball fans that went through there for 19 years. Now, the former home of the Braves, built for the 1996 Olympics, will receive a new name. It's been sold by Georgia State University, and they've signed a $22 million deal with a company called Center Park Credit Union. I didn't know credit unions made that kind of change. Apparently, they do. It's one of the richest of its kind outside of the Power Five conferences. And according to our partners, the Atlanta Business Chronicle, the school will reveal tomorrow that the stadium will now be called Center Park Credit Union. Now, with the passing of the baton, I, I, we lose another footprint, at least formally, of the man whose name was once ubiquitous here in Atlanta, Ted Turner. Now, of course, earlier this summer, we learned that the CNN Center is up for sale. CNN isn't really based in Atlanta anymore. I mean, it's pretty much all in New York. He gave Atlanta an international identity, a, a cachet of cool, uh, and, and brought so much here, CNN and TNT. And I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Braves, Thrashers, Phillips Arena, Goodwill Games, Captain Planet, to name a few, brought a swagger, glamour, Jane Fonda, whether you liked her or not. He was just Atlanta, wasn't he? And now there are so many young people here in transplants that, you know, they don't remember Ted Turner much. Mr. Turner himself has been battling ill health, living mostly in Montana. He's 80, he'll be 82 in November. And uh, you know what? I don't know anything about that credit union, but I know a lot about Ted Turner and I know what he means. And you know what? That stadium may have th that, that name on it, but it's always gonna be Turner Field. No doubt about that. Ahead on prime time, a Black Panther turned convicted police killer serving a life sentence. And now that the Fulton County District Attorney is up for re-election, his son is asking for a fresh look at this case. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID. Today, the son of an ex-militant civil rights leader is asking for the reopening of his father's case. Jamil Alamine is a Black Panther turned religious leader who used to be known as H. Rep. Brown. 
In 2002, he was convicted of killing a Fulton County Sheriff's deputy and was sentenced to life in prison. So far, efforts to get his conviction overturned have failed. And now his son says with the Fulton County District Attorney seat up for grabs in tomorrow's runoff election, he wants whoever wins to take another look at the case. And so we wanted to take this time to address both candidates in this year's election for Fulton County District Attorney, not to pick a side, but to ask that whichever one of them wins, they do the right thing as, you know, the, the current environment in America is social justice and doing the right thing as far as social justice is concerned. And the man that is locked behind these walls, Imam Jamil Alameen H. Rap Brown, has done so much to fight for those social justices that for us to be quiet now when he needs us most is unacceptable. We have reached out to the current district attorney, Paul Howard, to see if he has plans to look at this case again. So far, we have not heard back. Right now on prime time, another test for Georgia's election system. The steps one county is taking to make sure long voter lines and technical gaps remain in the past. And a new weapon in the fight to flatten Georgia's coronavirus curve. So why will this mega testing site focus on just the next 12 days? We're getting you answers straight ahead. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Well, as you know, testing has always been a central part of the efforts to curb and contain COVID-19. And it's really something on the minds of a lot of families right now as thousands of kids in Georgia head back to classes after one week of in-person instruction. More than 450 Cherokee County students are in quarantine, and that's not the only district seeing reports of positive cases and parents are really concerned. Now a state representative is offering an outlet so students and teachers can share concerns without fear of retribution. Tracy A. McPeer has more. In less than 72 hours, State Representative Beth Moore says she's received more than 200 whistleblower emails from teachers and students across the state. With complaints and concerns ranging from large class sizes without social distancing to not wearing masks to a lack of cleaning supplies. She kept names anonymous but shared some of their claims like this one from a teacher in Fulton County. I have a coworker who has decided to report to the building today even though she had a positive COVID test last week. Couldn't sleep last night because I feel as if I may be exposed today. We require employees to report both symptoms consistent with COVID-19 or diagnosis of a positive case. Any employee who fails to do so is subject to discipline up to and including termination. The concerned coworker should direct their concern to HR, the FCS tip line, fraud waste abuse line, which can be made anonymously or the zone superintendent for their school. In other words, there are numerous ways to alert the district and to have the matter assessed. Moore says she also received emails from students in Cherokee County claiming they were bullied over wanting to wear masks. Now we talked to the school district and they say they have no reports of bullying over masks. And they also say they already have a safe schools reporting system where students can report issues like bullying and stay anonymous. Today, after one week of in-person learning, students in Paulding County attended class online. The district moved to virtual learning today and tomorrow after nine people in North Paulding High School tested positive for COVID-19. The principal says they were all in the building at some point last week. This is the same school now famous for this viral photo from Hannah Waters. She shared it last week of packed hallways. She and another student were suspended for sharing pictures of what school was like that first week. Those suspensions have since been lifted. We asked how she felt to be moving online. If they had delayed school like other counties are doing, they could have had this time to think it through to make a plan that could have lasted a lot longer than this one. So we could have not just been shoved into the school as guinea pigs. We also caught up with a woman who says her nephews are two of the students who tested positive at North Paulding High. She says they're doing well, but that doesn't ease her concerns. They've both been home all week. They have both, they're both feeling much better. However, <laughs> who knows who they infected on Monday when they were at school all day long with no mask. Honestly, I would wish that they would just go virtual. The superintendent says parents will know by Tuesday night when kids will be able to head back to class. Now dealing with some uh, technical issues as kids get ready to start virtual learning in just a couple of days. A spokesperson confirms while some families could access the online portal during a tech check today, others could not log on at all. 
They say they are still looking for why. And, uh, but right now, the portal is back up and functioning once again, and they're going to continue to check to make sure that it's working ahead of Wednesday's deadline. And a new mega testing site is now opened up near Hartsfield Jackson Airport. The goal is to curb the spread of the virus in Clayton County, where the infection rate is much higher than the state's overall positivity rate. 11 Alive's Joe Henke explains. The testing site behind me opened at 9 a.m. It will be open for the next 12 days, and health officials tell me they hope to test up to 5,000 people per day here, allowing them to better and quickly identify those who are carrying the virus, especially people who are asymptomatic and need to isolate. Federal and state health officials turned this airport parking lot into a COVID-19 testing site in a location where people have been testing positive for the virus at a rate much higher than the state as a whole, according to Governor Brian Kemp. During a press conference this morning to discuss the testing site, Kemp said in Clayton County, 20% of COVID-19 tests are coming back positive, compared to 8.2% statewide as of Sunday afternoon. The testing site will now be open Monday through Friday from 9 to 5. Testing is free and open to any Georgia resident, regardless of symptoms. U.S. Surgeon General Jerome Adams joined Kemp to open the site today. Adams said in 12 days, state health officials should look at the latest testing numbers and then decide if this testing site should remain open, which he added should be only one part of a larger testing system. This site is all about volume, making sure we can get as many people tested in a surge capacity as we can over 12 days, but it should only be part of a plan that includes, again, mobile testing, putting testing in communities where people can walk up and where people can easily access it. The Georgia Department of Public Health is telling people to expect to receive their results in two to three days after being tested. The Surgeon General saying the quick turnaround time is key to identifying who is carrying the virus and needs to isolate. And for anyone wanting to be tested at this site, you are being asked to register in advance online. You do not need to have symptoms to be tested here. We have the link for registration inside this story on 11alive.com. And I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. It was a busy afternoon with a lot of showers and storms that moved through the area. Some of those were severe with some tree damage, power outages. I've got about 250, almost 300 people on Facebook Live right now. We had a few folks on here saying, I'm trying to roll back to see what it was, where some people said that they um, had some power outages. Uh, earlier today uh, up in parts of North Georgia from the storms that rolled through a little bit earlier. We now have folks talking about, um, you know, what to expect for tomorrow. Are we going to see more storms developing? And that answer is yes. We are going to see more scattered showers developing. Right now, we're dry in Atlanta. We had these showers and storms that moved through earlier. They're now well to the south. But I know you're probably, well, here's that activity down to the south. Toward LaGrange, uh, uh, Meriwether County, over in Thomaston, they're still dealing with some light rain that's moving out. In Atlanta, we are fine. But I know you're probably looking at this up in North Alabama thinking, oh, no, is this another band of showers and storms coming in? Well, it is for North Alabama. But as this tries to move into North Georgia, it's hitting some uh, more stable air and cooler air compared to where we were earlier. So as it moves into North Georgia, maybe a few showers there, but we aren't expecting any strong storms. Now in Northwest Georgia, looking over to the West, you most likely are seeing some thunder or they're seeing some lightning and hearing some thunder. But again, we don't think it's going to be severe here. Also a major system. This is a derecho that's up in north, uh, the north of us moving through the Midwest. That's causing a lot of wind damage, heavy rain, severe thunderstorms along that. I had a few people ask earlier as well, is that going to make it into Georgia tonight or tomorrow morning? And that answer is no, it's going to fall apart as well. Let's take a live look out there right now. This is our tower cam uh, that we're watching up in Rome. Uh, they didn't have a lot of, of storms earlier in Rome, just a few showers but the roads and the streets are dry right now in the downtown area. The flags aren't really blowing that much, pretty calm, but we'll keep an eye on the skies up in northwest Georgia to see if we, if we see any lightning there from the distance. Stay with us. We'll talk about the timing on some of those storms that will redevelop tomorrow and whether or not they can turn strong. I'll have more on that in just, in just a few minutes. On new on primetime, another Confederate monument is coming down. Tonight, crews started removing the memorial to the Confederate soldiers in downtown Athens. The monument is being moved to another location later this fall near Barber Creek. In its place, the city will expand the crosswalk, accommodating hundreds of more pedestrians. Now to a developing story out of Washington, D.C. The Secret Service says they were forced to shoot a person outside the White House temporarily disrupting President Donald Trump's daily coronavirus briefing. And the Dow, Dow Jones, are going to be, I mean, the way they're going, it looks like they're just about going to be topping records, hopefully soon. Excuse me? 
Well, you can see right there, a member of the Secret Service got President Trump out of that briefing room and back into the Oval Office. And you can see the reporters rushing out to the windows to see what happened. Several minutes later, he returned and confirmed with reporters that Secret Service shot an armed person outside the White House fencing. President Trump says the person was taken to a local hospital. Once he returned back to the briefing room, he talked about what had happened. Uh, just told me when he came up, you pretty much saw it like I did. He said, sir, could you please come with me? So you were surprised. I was surprised also. I think it's probably pretty unusual. But uh, very, very professional people. They do a fantastic job, as you know. So at this point, we don't know exactly what that person was doing, only that they were armed. This is according to the Secret Service and shot outside the White House fencing by the Secret Service. Of course, we're going to continue to bring you updates as we get them on 11alive.com. Tomorrow is Georgia's primary runoff election. Polls are open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., and you will still be allowed to cast your vote if you're in line at 7 p.m. There are several races on the ballot, including the U.S. House of Representatives and Fulton County District Attorney. That's a big one. Fulton County saw some of the worst wait times during the last election, with voters standing in line for hours to cast their ballots. Since then, officials have made several changes aimed at really improving the voting experience. One of the biggest concerns addressed the lack of training poll workers. In June, there were a lot of complaints that we were not fully staffed, didn't have enough people. But we've worked very hard on staffing, recruiting people, and training our staff. Thousands of people applied to become poll workers, and we have been working with and training many of those so that we will be well staffed, well prepared for tomorrow. Fulton Elections Chairman Rob Pitt says the county will also have at least one voting machine technician at each of tomorrow's 174 polling locations to troubleshoot any issues. Some other initiatives Fulton is already putting into action, expanding early voting locations, including using State Farm Arena, creating a dedicated call center for questions about absentee ballots and an issue many of you reached out about increasing privacy by ordering longer partitions to shield those voting machines. The entire 11 Alive political team will keep you covered tomorrow and throughout this big election year. We're going to bring you live results as they happen, as well as any analysis of the major issues and concerns. If you have a story you think we should cover, email us at where ATL speaks at 11 alive.com. Well, the governor's coronavirus orders do not allow cities to have tougher rules than the state. But a new poll, a new poll out shows Governor Brian Kemp may be out of step with 69% of the people favoring local input. 11 Alive's Doug Richards explains. The poll does show that Georgia Democrats and Republicans are sharply divided on issues surrounding the pandemic, but that they also have come to perhaps a surprising consensus on a couple of important issues. From the partisan divide, we see that Democrats and Republicans disagree on President Trump's handling of the coronavirus, on Governor Brian Kemp's handling of it as well. They even disagree on whether schools should reopen, with more Republicans wanting in-person classes only and more Democrats wanting schools to stay closed. The divide softens on the question of whether Governor Kemp should have total authority to call the shots on pandemic guidelines or whether local mayors like Atlanta's Keisha Lance Bottoms should have input. Asked if Georgia cities and towns should be able to write their own stricter guidelines, 69% of all Georgians said yes. 78% of Democrats said yes. 62% of Republicans also agreed. Asked if wearing masks at all indoor public places should be mandatory, 62% said yes. And that included 44% of Republicans, 77% of Democrats, also said yes. Not a surprise, says Republican former state representative Buzz Brockway. Mask wearing seems to be controversial on social media and in and nowhere else. <laughs> it's, it's one of those issues, I think, where social media is way out of step with the real world. It's worth noting that 72% of Democrats told our pollster they are concerned or very concerned that they will personally get the coronavirus. Only 56% of Republicans said the same thing. And coming up tomorrow on Morning Rush, we're going to release our poll results for the upcoming general election, which includes the races for state senator and president of the United States. So watch the results starting at 5 a.m. on our sister station, 11 Alive.
11 Alive is committed to bring you the latest on where Georgia stands in the fight against COVID-19. You're going to find analysis and context on case numbers anytime on the 11 Alive app. All right, straight ahead. A traffic stop in South Georgia is getting attention from the NAACP after an officer fired at a car with children inside. The latest on the investigation next. And don't forget, we're streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. That's where you can take us on the go and watch live. Subscribe and join the conversation as well. More 11 Alive news in prime time coming up after the break. And every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you. We hear you. And we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. A Gwinnett County business has now been named a person of interest in another case where a high school grad was killed. 18 year old Joshua Thomas Brandt was arrested Saturday. Police said that on Friday he showed up at a business on Satellite Boulevard and just started shooting, killing 38 year old James Ross of Loganville. Police told us that they believe that Ross was targeted and have not said why. Today, the name they named Brandt as a person of interest in the stabbing death of Slade Petty. Now, Petty was killed two weeks ago in an apartment on McGinnis Ferry Road, about a couple of miles away from Friday's crime scene. His murder is the first in Suwannee in more than a decade. Police say that Petty and Brandt knew each other. They both went to the same high school, but they have not offered a motive or said how this case could be tied to Friday's. According to a, a GoFundMe page, Petty's family set up. He had just graduated from North Gwinnett High School. His mom tells 11 Alive that he never hang up the phone without saying that he loved her. If you know anything, there's a $10,000 reward in this case. A Georgia family is demanding answers after police officers fired shots at a car with kids inside on Saturday in South Georgia. The GBI is investigating what happened during the chaotic traffic stop, which has since gained attention from the Georgia NAACP. Blaine Alexander reports. This, what they saw that, bro. this video shows the chaotic aftermath of a confrontation between South Georgia police and a car full of minors. They're shooting at them. For what? You know the kids. You see their kids and you still shooting? State officials are investigating what led up to an officer firing repeatedly at the vehicle. These are kids. These are minors. According to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, a Waycross police officer tried to get license plate information on the car. Three minors, ages 9, 12, and 14, got out and ran. When a second officer came to help, the GBI says the car drove toward that officer who started shooting. My little sister's going to be remembered running from the police and falling in the grass of her own yard and almost getting shot. Inside the car, a 15 and 16-year-old, both facing charges, including driving without a license, aggravated assault on an officer, and both charged with weapons possession. Their father told a local station the gun was in the glove compartment and registered to their mother. Those are the children, man! Now the local NAACP is demanding release of the police body camera and dash cam video. 
The most concerning aspect is a nine-year-old and a 12-year-old were subject to having guns fired in their presence or around them. Uh, and so our concern is the level of force that was used. The GBI says no officers were injured and two have been placed on administrative leave. So far, the GBI has investigated 59 officer-involved shootings in Georgia this year, including four this weekend alone. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. My phone's still propped up right here as we're talking to a bunch of folks on Facebook Live right now. A lot of folks are asking about the storms. They're telling me their stories about the storms from earlier today and wondering if we're going to have any more. And we're watching a couple of things here. Number one, we're fine in Atlanta. We had the showers and the storms that moved through our area earlier. It brought a lot of damage in some spots. Now what is left of that system is moving down to the south. Just a few lingering showers here in parts of Troop County, Meriwether County, Upton County, near Thomaston. That's pretty much moved out of your area and also on the east side. We're dry in Atlanta, but now we're keeping an eye on some of these storms in North Alabama. Now I want you to notice here as these storms were in Tennessee moving down to the south. Notice how they're pretty much staying over into Alabama as they move in, try to move into Georgia. They're hitting the more stable air and rain cooled air from the storms that came through our area earlier. Those storms kind of worked over the atmosphere. So these storms in Tennessee that are moving into North Alabama are pretty much going to stay in Alabama, push down to the south, and they're start starting to show some signs of weakening as they move down to the south. So we're not worried about those moving in here. There is a severe thunderstorm warning uh, up near the Huntsville area, but again, that's not going to move in. Also, big time news. If you on social media, maybe you've seen some of the uh, videos or pictures out of the upper mid west with this big windstorm. It's called a derecho that has been moving in. Iowa had a lot of damage today, went through Chicago. Now it's moving on over to the east. It's, it's weakening, but it's still a big line, long lived line of a wind event and storms here that continues to move on over to the east. We have got a couple of severe thunderstorm warnings up to the north in uh, parts of uh, Ohio right now. And uh, as, as this system continues to move uh, on down to the south, that's actually into Indiana. I'm sorry about that. And then Ohio is moving into Ohio as well. As it moves closer to us, I've had a few people on Facebook Live asking if this was going to make it. It's not going to make it into Georgia. Maybe a couple of showers far north really early in the morning, but it's not going to be a big event when it moves in here. All right, let me show you what else we're watching. Here's a live look. This is our tower cam in Rome uh, showing the dry conditions that we have in Rome right now with a little bit of a breeze. Earlier I showed you this and the flags were just pretty much sitting still. Now with just a bit of a breeze there uh, up in Rome. So let me show you what we're watching uh, as we go through the rest of the nighttime hours. This is our high resolution rapid refresh model showing that activity in North Alabama. Notice how that pretty much stays. The, the heavier stuff stays over into Alabama as it continues to try to push on down to the south a little bit, but it falls apart coming into northwest Georgia. Again, there might be a couple of showers there in the middle of the nighttime hours, but nothing really strong and it falls apart before it gets here. The second surge that you see here in the morning, that's what is left over from that system up to the north that may hold together and it's going to be a lot weaker, but it could bring a couple of showers in to northwest Georgia and west Georgia falling apart before it makes it to Atlanta. Talk about the more stable air and the cooler air. Let me show you this. You know, before the rain came in today, we got up into the mid 90s and now we're in the mid 70s. We have a lot of 70s all around. It wasn't a cold front that came in. This is just a, an area of disturbed weather that had a lot of rain with it, and this is the impact that we felt from the rain cooled air. So that was a good thing. Uh, tomorrow it's going to be hot again, 92 for a high. We'll give that a six on the wasometer. That's our scale from one to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day, and uh, about a 40% chance for some afternoon storms to redevelop. So here we go tonight. That activity to the north falling apart. In the morning, this is what's left of that system that's now up in the Midwest. That's falling apart as it moves in, and then during the day tomorrow, a dry first part of the day and at lunchtime, but in the afternoon, some of those scattered showers redeveloping. A couple of those could persist into the evening as well. We'll keep a 40% chance both Tuesday and Wednesday, and then Thursday and Friday, the rain chance is up a little bit. We'll go up to a 60% chance Thursday and Friday, and that will help the temperatures hold in the upper 80s for afternoon highs, down to a 40% chance Saturday, lower rain chances Sunday at 30%, and even some drier air in here by Monday with a 20% chance for showers, but temperatures back to the lower 90s. On the other side of the break, our Why Guy explains why some kids out there have such a hard time when it comes to wearing a mask and what parents can do to make this whole experience a lot easier. The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. 
Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make it. The COVID-19 pandemic has really made masks a part of our daily wardrobe. As kids head back to school, Many have struggled, but why is wearing a mask so hard for them? And what can parents do? Here's our why guy. Halloween is an occasion when you expect to see children in masks. You don't expect it day after day. For many youngsters, a face covering can be far more than just uncomfortable. A lot of children are afraid of masks. Let's explore why young children have difficulty with masks and what parents can do to help. Adults can find masks uncomfortable, but we understand the need in the COVID-19 era. Dr. Joanna Dolgoff is a pediatrician who says children can't make that leap. Children cognitively can't understand the importance of wearing a mask. It doesn't feel good, it's uncomfortable, they can't breathe, it's claustrophobic. That's all they know. They don't like it and they want it off. Youngsters rely on a smile or a familiar face to feel safe. When that's covered, they can grow uneasy. They're actually scared of them. But there are things that we can do as parents to help them get over this fear. For example, both you and your child wearing masks together while in front of a mirror. You can also put a mask on your child's favorite stuffed animal, or you can draw in a mask on your child's favorite storybook character. Introduce the mask slowly. Practice, practice, practice with your child. Sit with them in the mask for a few minutes. The next day, sit a few minutes longer. Dr. Dolgoff says some children will take to them right away. Others need more time to understand we live in an era when masks are not just for Halloween. If you have a question for Jerry Carnes, our Y guy, send it to us on Facebook, Twitter, or in an email. She's been struggling to pay the bills for months because of the pandemic, but after we shared her story, the support came rolling in. We're going to have an update on the Mayweather family coming up. Where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. The number of new coronavirus cases continues to fall in Georgia, a trend highlighted by Governor Brian Kemp today. However, sadly, we are still seeing high numbers of deaths. Today, the Department of Public Health reported 30 more people in our state have died from the virus. Reveal investigator Rebecca Lindstrom looks at some of the numbers behind the heartache. The number of new cases may be trending down, but every organization that tracks COVID's impact still has Georgia in the red. That means this virus is not under control and is spreading through every age group in every part of the state. Just look at the number of people who died in the past two weeks in the four largest metro counties. Gwinnett and Fulton lead the way with more than 50 each. And these four counties alone make up nearly a quarter of the 758 people who died with COVID since the end of July. The other 75% are scattered throughout the state. The Department of Public Health doesn't separate white from Latino people in its data, but together they make up the largest number of people who died, 364 in the past two weeks. Black people made up 270 of those deaths and 10 people were of Asian descent. As of July 31st, our team at the Georgia Department of Community Health has surveyed 100%, 100% of our skilled nursing facilities for compliance with infection control measures. Today, the governor proudly discussed the state's efforts to curb the virus's spread in our long-term care facilities. That's a positive step, but in the past two weeks, 277 people still died in our nursing homes. That's more than a third of our deaths. While those 60 and older remain the greatest at risk for severe complications, more than half of those who died in this age group were not living in nursing homes. They were a part of our general population. Thanks to increased testing, we're catching asymptomatic people faster. But 20% of those who need intense medical treatment are still dying. When you simply look at the total loss of life, the numbers are growing. From an average of 16 people every day at the beginning of July to 50 people right now. 
Democrats are highly criticizing President Trump after a series of executive orders addressing the country's economic crisis. The orders include a new weekly unemployment bonus payment of $400. That's less than the $600 people were initially getting. Another major highlight is a suspension of payroll taxes for people making less than $100,000 a year. The deferred tax would still be owed next year unless Congress agrees to waive it. That tax money funds Social Security and Medicare. But the president promises this will not impact Social Security. Democrats in Congress are criticizing the president's negotiators after talks of another relief bill fell apart last week. We said to the president, uh, to the president's negotiators uh, last week, we'll meet you in the middle. Right. We'll cut a trillion, you raise a trillion. You know what they said? Absolutely not. I said to them, you mean it's your way or the highway? And they said, yep. Since the economic crisis started, we've turned to financial analyst Andrew Polos to answer your questions and really get an idea about what all of these changes means for the everyday person. We asked him about whether the president has the power to make these moves. The president has the National Emergencies Act, which gives him a roughly about 136 statutory powers where he can sidestep Congress on this. Uh, I personally think the con that the president has uh, pulled a political move here to get Congress to act and do something. Uh, if you notice that the unemployment benefits and everything under this executive order is to begin in September. So we're in second week of August, I think, between now and the end of August. I think the president's using this as a strategy to be able to get both Republicans and Democrats in Congress to act and do something for the American people. We also asked him about this unemployment benefit boost of $400 per week. A $100 chunk of that is supposed to come from the states. Andrew says this may not be a long-term solution. Yeah, well, we're seeing a lot of states who are uh, having budget issues, uh, budget constraints. Um, so I don't think that as it stands now, this is more what the president has done, if it uh, works, is going to be more of a Band-Aid, not a permanent solution. A permanent solution and permanent law is going to have to come from Congress, so they're going to have to act. Uh, there's roughly about somewhere 44 to $50 billion uh, allocated for this extension of the unemployment at the $400 a week rate, which is not going to last for probably more than a few weeks. The other executive orders include an effort to halt ev uh, evictions, that is, and to suspend student loans. President Trump says he is open to more talks with Democrats. The unemployment rate for black Americans is stuck at a staggering 14.6 percent, much higher than the overall rate. And one Atlanta mom is still struggling to make ends meet months into this pandemic. NBC's Steve Patterson spoke with her. Every day, Kenesha Mayweather inches closer to her breaking point. The only currency she has in abundance right now, faith. I do a lot of praying. I, I think about my kids. They need me. I've broke down plenty of nights thinking, what am I going to do? We first profiled Mayweather back in June when black Americans were facing their highest unemployment rate in a decade. Mayweather, who lives in Atlanta, felt forced to quit her job in April, afraid of exposing her three children to COVID. I feel sad because I can't provide for my kids like I normally would. Mayweather's eldest daughter diagnosed with a rare form of cancer, her youngest breathing problems. If I don't have to take them out, I will not take them out. And just last week, another devastating blow. Right now, I just received the email that I was getting my last check. That additional $600 the federal government had given to unemployed Americans like Mayweather, gone. Don't know how I'm going to continue to pay my bills. I'm going to have to borrow, I guess, and hopefully everything gets... Paid. 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks, and ever since NBC Nightly News first shared that story, we had just been flooded, folks, with emails asking, asking how they can support the Mayweather family. So there is a GoFundMe site where you can donate. The family was uh, only asking for about $2,000, just enough to pay those bills. But as of today, the community has really stepped up to help them out. They've raised more than $13,000. And so many people are encouraging the Mayweather family to just stay strong, not give up, just keep pushing and hoping. And hopefully this will help them out of this very difficult situation. 
And we are in a drier pattern right now after all the showers and storms that came through earlier. Most of that activity has pushed well down to the south and is out of here. But now we're watching these additional storms up in uh, North Alabama that are pretty much going to stay in Alabama and not really make it over into North Georgia. Maybe just a couple of light showers in Dade Walker County, maybe into Chattooga County. And you folks in Northwest Georgia are most likely seeing some of the lightning or hearing the thunder out of this activity back in Alabama. But that's going to weaken as it moves down to the south and it's really not going to move into our area during the overnight hours. The showers and storms that we had earlier have pushed well down to the south in Atlanta. We're looking fine right now. Something else we're watching. This is a big time storm system uh, in the Midwest right now. It's a derecho. It's a long lived wind event and storm event here. That's trying to push down toward the southeast. It is showing signs of weakening. It could kick up a couple of showers early in the morning in far northwest Georgia before it totally falls apart. Let's take a look out there right now and you you can see a live look still up in Rome where the roads are dry. Uh, not much going on down there with uh, a nice night with temperatures that are in the 70s. When that rain came in earlier, it really helped to cool things down a little bit. It wasn't a cold front, but it was rain cooled air that dropped those temperatures. It was really warm out there today. We got up to 95 degrees for a high. That was before the rain. And then when the rain came in, those temperatures fell into the 70s and we've been holding in the 70s ever since. And we picked up about 18 hundredths of an inch of rain officially at Hartsfield Jackson. I know some of you got a lot more than that in some of those heavier down pours with some of those severe storms earlier. Stay with us. We're going to talk about another round of showers and storms developing tomorrow, and we'll talk about the likelihood that whether or not some of those could turn strong. All right, Chris, thanks a lot. You know, soon college presidents all across our country, they're going to have to make some really tough decisions about sports this fall. Right now, the future of college football is unclear. It's up in the air, but many players are making their voices heard and unifying behind one message. 11 Alive's Alex Glaze has their story. We want to play. As the 2020 fall college football season hangs in the balance, Clemson quarterback Trevor Lawrence ended a tweet with those four words Sunday night and it quickly transformed into a movement. It's great to see somebody stand up and lead on behalf of the student athletes. And seeing Trevor Lawrence, who's probably one of, if not the best college football player in America, to stand up and really rally the troops and say, guys, listen to what we're saying. We're the ones who are playing the game and we want to play. Later in a tweet, Lawrence posted a statement attributed to representatives of the players of the Power Five conferences, calling on the conferences to take certain actions to make football this fall feasible. Most notably, the players called for a college football players association. We're talking about players becoming employees, right? And, and so there's a lot of kind of unintended consequences that come with that. But I think if it's led by smart people, the right people, um, you know, people that understand kind of how collegiate finances work and, and, and what you're what you're getting into if you decide to unionize, then yeah, I think it could work. President Trump quote tweeted Lawrence's post and added, the student athletes have been working too hard for their season to be canceled. Hashtag, we want to play. The pandemic has taken a huge toll on the Atlanta Braves. According to our partners at the Atlanta Business Chronicle, the team lost 95% of its revenue in the second quarter of this year. So to give you a better understanding of how this works, give you perspective here, that's $11 million in revenue compared to $208 million the team made during the same time last year. The team still has more than $700 million bucks in debt to pay off for uh, developments in and around the battery. In June, MLB clubs were allowed to start furloughing and or reducing pay for some of the workers. And since April, the company has, that provides food and drinks for the games has furloughed more than 1,000 employees. With the United States passing 5 million COVID-19 cases, new research is shining a light on the window in which people can spread the virus and how dangerous that can be for large gatherings. the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. 
Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the The United States has surpassed 5 million cases of COVID-19. Now that's more than any other country in the world by far. Now new research is shining a light on how massive gatherings can actually contribute to the spread of the virus. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has more on what some researchers now think is a short but potentially disastrous window of time. This morning, growing concern over potential super spreading events, which may be fueling a dramatic spike in coronavirus cases. <laughs> Tensions boiling over outside a church in Ventura County, California, where pro-mass demonstrators had gathered. Godspeed Calvary Chapel defying statewide orders with indoor services. Now you get a chance to greet one another, uh, you know, however you like. There's freedom. Say hello. In Sturgis, South Dakota, a 10-day motorcycle rally that's expected to draw up to a quarter million people is still underway. All the other bike shows have been canceled nationwide. No masks required. To me, uh, a, a little bit frightening. Dr. Joshua Schiffer is with the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. He and his colleagues published a paper that's not been peer-reviewed, but it found that coronavirus super-spreading events are the result of the right people at the wrong place at the wrong time time. 10 to 20 percent of people are responsible for about 80 percent of the infections. Then there are these less common but extremely important events where one person can infect dozens of sometimes over a hundred people. According to a model his team built, the riskiest window for transmission may be very brief, just a one or two day period in the week after a person is infected. But that window could be a huge problem if the person happens to be surrounded by crowds. The most obvious thing is you would try to prevent an unnecessary congregation of people in a tight environment. With the U.S. topping 5 million cases, these five states combined now make up more than 40 percent of the infections. In Chicago, beaches remain closed, but dozens gathered on one over the weekend anyway. You know, that picture was, I think, horrifying to many people uh, standing here. 
You know, researchers say the virus can still spread outside that short window. Dr. Schiffer says that people should, shouldn't let up, and we've heard this many times before, right? We should not let up on wearing those masks and continue social distancing. But uh, the longer an infection drags on, the less likely a person will be contagious. We're in a dry pattern right now. We're watching a couple of things, though. A few showers and storms up in Alabama, and then those showers down to the south of us that have already moved away. And then there's yet another system in the Midwest that we're keeping an eye on as it tries to move toward the south. Uh, some of you in North Georgia, um, Northwest Georgia, may be seeing some of this lightning from the distance now that it's dark, and maybe hearing some of that thunder there from the storms that are over in Alabama. But uh, don't get overly concerned. Maybe a little bit of light rain here. Nothing really strong, though, moving into Northwest Georgia, our area here is a lot more stable. The showers and storms that we had earlier have pushed well down to the south. We're actually dry in Atlanta right now. But here's the other system that we're watching. This is a big time storm event that's been moving through the Midwest. It is weakening a little bit. It's going to be pushing toward the south and early in the morning. 7, 8 o'clock. There might be a couple of lingering showers still left over from that that might move into northwest Georgia, but we're not expecting a big time storm event with that in Georgia as what they're having up in uh, in the Midwest right now. Take a live look out there right now. This camera is going to be kind of dark when I show this to you. Uh, you can see the lights there at the bottom. What we're doing, this is our Rome Tower cam, and I'm looking kind of more toward the north and west to see if we can see any of that lightning in the distance from those storms that are over into Alabama. And at the point I'm not really seeing much right there but I'm going to keep an eye on that as those move just to the west of the Rome area. Now here's what we're watching as we uh, take a look at the weather headlines through the rest of the week. We're really going to be in an unsettled pattern where each and every afternoon we're still going to have the potential for some of those storms around. Temperatures are still going to be hot with temperatures that will be into the uh, lower and even some mid 90s in some spots. We do see some slightly uh, cooler temperatures if you want to call upper 80s cooler, but at least not as hot on uh, Wednesday and Thursday, actually Thursday and Friday as we see the rain chances a little bit higher and that's going to help those temperatures come down just a little bit. Tomorrow's rain chance is going to be at 40% mainly in the afternoon and evening hours still going to be warm. High temperatures up to 92 degrees in the afternoon on our scale from 1 to 11 where an 11 is a perfect day. We're going to go with a 6 on the wisometer. Here's what we're watching tonight. There's that activity in North Alabama. Watch how that during this evening is really going to fall apart. All right, and then early in the morning this coming into northwest Georgia is what is left of that system that's up in the Midwest that's going to be falling apart, but it could shake out a couple of showers up in north Georgia as it rolls in early in the morning. We're going to start off here in metro Atlanta with some fog in some areas and then at lunchtime uh, clouds and some sunshine mixing in in the afternoon tomorrow. Scattered showers will be redeveloping here a few of those into the evening and then on Wednesday this model isn't really showing a lot in the form of showers and storms on Wednesday. I'm going still with the 40% chance for scattered showers. Every time a new model comes in, it starts to add a little bit more rain in there. So we'll on Wednesday still have a few scattered showers around. Let me take you out to the tropics. This is the time of year, of course, when uh, things start ramping up a little bit more. There's a system that we're watching out in the middle of the Atlantic right now, a tropical wave that uh, the weather service, actually the Hurricane Center, is giving us a 60% chance of developing uh, development over the next two to five days. The next name on the list is Josephine. Now it's way too early to tell whether or not this would have any impact on us here in the southeast, whether it would make it into the Gulf or stay out into the Atlantic. We'll keep an eye on the British and uh, U.S. Virgin Islands, also Puerto Rico. Some of these models kind of bring it into that direction, but it's way too early to tell exactly where this next system is going to go, if it even develops. So 92 for a high tomorrow, 93 Wednesday, 40% uh, chance for showers both days. Thursday and Friday, rain chance a little higher at 60%. And we think that'll help those temperatures stay into the upper 80s for highs. Then on a Saturday, rain chance at 40%, down a little bit Sunday to 30%, down a little bit more Monday to 20% with high temperatures moving back into the lower 90s. Because of the coronavirus pandemic, a lot of people are looking to vote by mail in the upcoming election. November 3rd is going to be here before we know it, right? So Francis Abbey put together some tips on how to vote by mail and make it count. Want to vote by mail? Here's what you need to know. Most states are looking to make it easier to vote by mail this year due to the coronavirus. There are currently five states that conduct all elections by mail, Colorado, Hawaii, Oregon, Washington, and Utah. For these elections, all registered voters receive a ballot in the mail. The voter marks the ballot, puts it in a secrecy envelope, and then into a separate mailing envelope. They sign an affidavit on the outside of the mailing envelope 
and either mail it in or drop it off. If you don't live in one of these states, you can go to vote.org, which will help guide you through the process. Here are five tips to get you started. First, make sure you're registered to vote. Not sure? You can check if and where you're registered on vote.org. If you're not registered, you can register there. Next, if you want to guarantee your vote by mail, request a mail-in ballot. Now, every state's rules are different, so vote.org can guide you to your state's website. Deadlines for mail-in ballots to be returned also vary by state, and they vary a lot. Some states need to receive your ballots by election day. In other states, your ballot needs to be postmarked by election day. So make sure to check your state on vote.org. You should request your mail-in ballot well before election day. The Postal Service recommends 15 days round trip to receive it and send it back. Some states are reporting delays with the Postal Service, so the earlier, the better. Finally, you have the right to vote. If anyone tries to stop you, call the Election Protection Hotline at 1-866-687-8683. Our Decision 2020 political team is covering the issues that matter most to you and your family this election cycle. We're talking things like health care and, of course, the economy. If you have something you want us to cover, send us an email to whereatlspeaks at 11alive.com. We'll be right back. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory disease. All right, stick around. Primetime rolls on at 10 o'clock, and we'll see you over on 11 Alive for up late at 11. Lily, everyone in the house is online and I can't get enough bandwidth to video chat with my book club. 
Try one gig internet with AT&T Fiber. You get more bandwidth and HBO Max included. So everyone stays entertained. So I can just watch the show instead of reading the book? You know, if you turn on your subtitles, that's almost reading. Get entertainment grade one gig internet with AT&T Fiber. Now with HBO Max included. Bundle with AT&T TV for $89.98 a month for a year. Limited availability in select areas. Call one only ATT. This summer, get back to where you belong, along 60 miles of beautiful wide open beaches, where family vacations have never been so much fun. With every sunrise and each high tide, the beach is calling you to raise your spirits, make you smile, and bring your family closer together. So stop dreaming and start booking, because we can't wait for you to get here. Visit Myrtle Beach and discover why happiness comes in waves. Awesome internet. It's more than just fast. It keeps all your devices running smoothly. With built-in security that protects your kids, no matter what they're up to. Protects your info and gives you 24-7 peace of mind. That if it's connected, it's protected. Here's a treat. Even that pet camera thingy. Oh. Can your internet do that? Xfinity X5 can, because it's simple, easy, awesome. <laughs> This is a tale of two kitties. This kitty uses ordinary litter. This kitty uses pretty litter. The world's smartest cat litter. And it's delivered right to your door. Its ultralight, super absorbent formula traps odors. And it does something no ordinary clay litter can do. Pretty Litter's color-changing crystals make it easy to monitor your cat's health, helping to avoid serious illness. She's switching to Pretty Litter. Smart move. Try Pretty Litter risk-free for 30 days. When you sign up, get free delivery. Go to prettylitter.com. System 5 Electronics makes it easy and convenient to manage your home, monitor your business, and stay connected to loved ones 24-7. Our Smart Solutions products provide you with a cutting-edge mobile app. This interactive experience places your security at your fingertips. System 5 Electronics provides life safety for thousands of families, homeowners, and businesses throughout Metro Atlanta. Smart solutions start as low as $24.50 per month and basic monitoring only $16.50 per month. System 5 Electronics. Security you can count on. The Checkers Chicken Bites and Fries Box is just $2.49. Packed with all white meat chicken and our famous Checkers Seasoned Fries. It's the perfect craveable combo of flavors. Grab a box anytime, from lunch to late night. That's $2.49 for crispy chicken bites and seasoned fries to enjoy wherever you go. On a walk, on a dock, at your workplace, even out in space. When you're on the go, this deal is the way to go. The Chicken Bites and Fries Box, only from Checkers and only $2.49. Get Checkers delivered. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. I'm Chinu Hurt. Tonight, a local teacher says she opposes students going back into the classroom and says she has thousands of supporters. And some recent high school graduates forced to choose between college and working to stay afloat during the pandemic. We talked to one teen about that really tough decision. Two separate crimes, police investigating one teen. The link between a deadly stabbing and a deadly shooting in Gwinnett County separated by just a couple of miles. New tonight, confirmed coronavirus cases across the globe have surpassed 20 million. The U.S. hit the hardest with a staggering 5 million confirmed cases. The states suffering the worst are New York, California, and Texas. But there is some better news here in our state. While the virus remains a threat, the cases in Georgia continue to fall. Governor Kemp highlighted this trend today. Sadly, we are still seeing high numbers of death in Georgia. Today, the Department of Public Health reported 30 more people have died with COVID in the state. Those numbers come as kids head back to school here in the Peach State. Parents really concerned about their child's health and school's policies. A study from the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Children's Hospital Association shows COVID-19 cases in children jumped 40% in the last half of just July. That means they now make up 8.8% .8 of total cases. The study considered data from 49 states, although the A range for who is considered a child that was different from state to state. Seems like the debate over in person learning versus virtual heats up every day and tonight an Atlanta Metro teacher says she is supporting virtual learning. 11 Alive Chinu her is live for us tonight in Atlanta and Chinu. She has a lot of support here. 
Yeah, absolutely, Aisha. She teaches here in the Atlanta metro area, and she says she started a Facebook group to uh, create a space for teachers to com uh, converse in, and she already has thousands of followers. For 30 years, Kathy Kelly George has taught music in schools. The COVID-19 pandemic has now put her and other teachers in a situation they've never been in before. I think in a nutshell, everyone is incredulous. To provide a safe space for teachers to have discussions, Kelly George created this private Facebook page, Teachers Against Opening School During a Pandemic. It started out with just her and two friends and has since exploded in members. And now we're at the four week mark and we have over 4,000 members. So it's a lot of teachers from all around the country who are concerned about the safety of returning. She says she's concerned about how other staff members, students and their families will be impacted, just like Angie Franks and her family. North Paulding High School's principal sent home a letter to families saying the school had nine positive COVID-19 cases after the first week of school. Her nephews are two of the students there who contracted the virus. Honestly, I would wish that they would just go virtual. I wish all schools would go virtual right now and let this virus die out. For your health in general, virtual is absolutely has to be the safest option. Kelly George says she hopes those who are critical of virtual learning understand this is about safety. In in May, we were heroes. We were essential. We were important. And that was nice and we didn't need that, but we were. And now we're lazy and we're inconsiderate and we're selfish and we are not. Now, Kelly George says to protect the teachers who are having discussions in that page, she has made it private and not searchable on Facebook. So either she has to invite you into the group or another member has to invite you. She knew her reporting from the bridge tonight. Thank you. Tomorrow, students in Paulding County could learn when they can make their way back into the classroom. A school board meeting is set for tomorrow night at 630, addressing how the district returns to school. Now, the district called off in-person learning for today and tomorrow after nine people tested positive at North Paulding High School. This is the same school where a student snapped that famous picture that went viral all around the world of students crowding together, nobody wearing a mask, and all heading in the right direction. New tonight at 10, teenagers and college students are really facing a different set of circumstances than ever before. Some are struggling to find work to support themselves during college, and some are planning to skip higher education altogether. Hope for a talk with the Metro Atlanta teen about her struggle. At the beginning of my senior year of high school, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Amari Toomer started her senior year at Carver High in South Atlanta with a solid plan. I was going to work. All through my senior year, I was going to save up at least $400 a month and have that for, for school. The 18-year-old would apply to a four-year university and work to support herself. Then came COVID. Tumor lost her job and had trouble finding another one. How am I going to survive while I'm here? A new study from Student Loan Hero shows 22% of college students will either transfer to a school closer to home, won't go at all, or remain unsure about their plans. And in Metro Atlanta, the nonprofit CARE is finding food insecurity is another concern. A lot of households are having their earnings and their income source is uh, disrupted by the pandemic. It's causing, you know, difficult decisions from all but all members of the household. According to CARE, food insecurity reduces a teen's chances of graduating from high school because hunger forces them to miss classes or they have to find a job to support their family. While the odds seem stacked against Tumor, she discovered a plan B for her education. Instead of the original plan of a university, she'll head to Atlanta Technical College since it's closer to home and she encourages other teens to find a way and not give up. Just keep going. Studies also show nearly half of teenagers and college students worry about finding work. Tumor managed to get a job with Amazon, which she hopes to start next week. 11 Alive is committed to bringing you the latest on where Georgia stands in the fight against COVID-19. You'll find analysis and context on case numbers anytime on the 11 Alive app. President Trump not backing down from his executive order on unemployment benefits. He says he talked with governors today to get money in the hands of Americans. Depending on the state, we have the right to do what we want to do. We can terminate the 25 percent. Uh, 
or we don't have to do that, so we'll see what it is. It depends on the individual state. The orders include a $400 weekly enhanced unemployment benefit. States would have to contribute $100 of that money. The president's plan is down from $600. The Democrats have been pushing to reinstate. Critics on both sides of the aisle call the orders unconstitutional. Now to a moment during today's news conference, President Trump left the podium quickly. That's a Secret Service agent right there ushering him out of the room. A shooting had just occurred uh, blocks away from the White House. You can see that Secret Service agent there. And then moments later, the president walked back in, telling reporters somebody with a gun was shot by the Secret Service and taken to a local hospital in D.C. A man is now behind bars after a two-year-old boy accidentally shoots himself in the head in northwest Atlanta. Atlanta police tell us the boy was left alone at home on Delray Drive Saturday morning when he found the gun and shot himself. The two-year-old is still in critical condition. Dontavious Wells, who was supposed to be watching the boy, is charged with child cruelty and firearm possession by a convicted felon. The suspect, Donald Gordy, got away but was later arrested in Alabama. We're told investigators found weapons in his truck. In Lamar County, a deputy recovering after authorities say he was ambushed. The sheriff's office says Deputy Justin Weaver responding to reports of a suspicious person Saturday night. They say he was sitting in his patrol car when the suspect ambushed him with a shotgun. Pellets hit him in the face and arm, but he is expected to survive this ordeal. New tonight, one man has been linked to two separate homicides in Gwinnett County. Our Ron Jones takes a look at the suspect and person of interest in those crimes. Joshua Thomas Brandt is 18 years old and he's accused of murder. Gwinnett County police say last Friday they were called to investigate an active shooter call on Satellite Boulevard in Suwanee where one person was shot and killed on the job. The man killed identified as 38-year-old James Ross. He was the only target. Once detectives and crime scenes started putting the pieces together, it was believed to be a target of homicide. The next day, police zeroed in on Brandt. Was it witnesses that came forward, just evidence left at the scene? What made you guys target him? Crime scene collected some evidence and collected some evidence in the woods that K-9 had tracked. And a motive? We have not been informed of any particular motive or reason yet. On July 27, Suwannee police say 18-year-old William Slade Petty was found stabbed multiple times outside his apartment building off McGinnis Ferry Road. Police won't reveal why Brent is a person of interest in that case, only to say they both attended the same high school this year. So the suspect does know your victim? Yeah. Officers say Brant and Petty attended North Gwinnett High School, but would not discuss their relationship. Tomorrow, Georgia's primary runoff election polls are open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. You will be allowed to cast your vote if you're in line at 7 p.m. There are several races on the ballot, U.S. House of Representatives, and the interesting one, the Fulton County District Attorney battle. The entire 11 Alive political team will keep you covered tomorrow and throughout the election year. We'll bring you live results as they occur as well as analyses of the major issues and concerns. If you have a story you think we ought to be on top of, email us at whereatlspeaks at 11alive.com. Majority of Georgians say Governor Kemp is out of step with how he's handling coronavirus. Coming up next, we break down the numbers in our exclusive poll. We had one round of storms that moved through earlier that are now well to the south, watching another line here in North Alabama and yet another one in the Midwest. Stay with us. We'll let you know if either of these will make it into our area. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Georgians want their mayors to have more say in issuing rules to cover coronavirus, COVID-19 and the pandemic. Local rules are disallowed by Governor Kemp's executive orders, and he, as you know, has gone to court with Atlanta's mayor to make sure he keeps it his way. Our exclusive 11 Alive poll indicates Kemp is out of step with the rest of the state, with 69% of respondents favoring local input. 11 Alive's Doug Richards has more. The poll does show that Georgia Democrats and Republicans are sharply divided on issues surrounding the pandemic, but that they also have come to perhaps a surprising consensus on a couple of important issues. From the partisan divide, we see that Democrats and Republicans disagree on President Trump's handling of the coronavirus, on Governor Brian Kemp's handling of it as well. They even disagree on whether schools should reopen, with more Republicans wanting in-person classes only and more Democrats wanting schools to stay closed. The divide softens on the question of whether Governor Kemp should have total authority to call the shots on pandemic guidelines or whether local mayors like Atlanta's Keisha Lance Bottoms should have input. Asked if Georgia cities and towns should be able to write their own stricter guidelines, 69% of all Georgians said yes. 78% of Democrats said yes. 62% of Republicans also agreed. Asked if wearing masks at all indoor public places should be mandatory, 62% said yes and that included 44% of Republicans. 77% of Democrats also said yes. Not a surprise, says Republican former state representative Buzz Brockway. Mask wearing seems to be controversial on social media and in and nowhere else. <laughs> it's, it's one of those issues, I think, where social media is way out of step with the real world. It's worth noting that 72% of Democrats told our pollster they are concerned or very concerned that they will personally get the coronavirus. Only 56% of Republicans said the same thing. We also polled voters on their thoughts about the upcoming election. We will have the results of our general election poll tomorrow on Morning Rush starting at 5 a.m. We had some severe weather today. It won't be the last of it this week. Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb now with a look at the seven day forecast. Yeah, Jeff, you know, we're watching just this pattern continue within the afternoons. So we're going to see a better chance of scattered showers and storms, and some of those could be strong, similar to what we had out there for today. The stuff that we had today is already well down to the south, and we're in a break in the action now, but there's another surge of rain coming in through North Alabama, and you can see some of the storms in association with that. And if you're looking at that, wondering if that's going to move through our area tonight, it's not going to make it here. In fact, maybe just a couple of showers in North Georgia. And folks, in Northwest Georgia, looking toward the west, toward the Alabama line, you might see some lightning out there, but nothing major for us here in Georgia. There's another system here. This has been a big news story in the Midwest with a, a, a big time rain event and wind event. This is called a derecho. It's a long lived wind event that's moved through Iowa and caused damage there through Chicago, through the upper Midwest. It is still uh, causing a lot of showers and storms right now. No severe thunderstorm warnings with that, but this is going to be pushing down toward the south, weakening as it does. Maybe by early tomorrow morning, there might be some spots in far northwest Georgia that might get in on that, but we don't think it's going to be anything really strong. Take a live look out there right now. This is going to be a dark tower cam. This is our Rome tower cam, uh, and I've kind of moved this looking toward the west because I wanted to look toward the Alabama line to see if we could, you know, see any lightning from the distance from the storms. OK, you just saw some of that right there. That's just from the distance. Some of that lightning that we see over into Alabama, but it's not really going to make it into Georgia. In fact, here's our high resolution rapid refresh model that takes us into the future. And it shows that most of that rain is going to stay out to the west. Maybe a couple of light showers in northwest Georgia, but the stronger storms are going to be in Alabama. And then in the morning, what you're seeing here, this is from that system in the Midwest that could sweep through. A couple of those showers may hold together in north and west Georgia uh, before it falls apart moving into Atlanta, but it's not going to be anything like the big wind event like they were dealing with in the Midwest today. Now, when our storms came through earlier, you know, we had a high today of 95 degrees. 
and then the rain came in and it dropped us down into the 70s and we've been in the 70s ever since and that's pretty much where we're going to be overnight and early in the morning. We'll wake up in the morning right around 72 degrees and then warming up to 92 in the afternoon. Another really hot day and it's going to be that heat along with the humidity in place that'll kick up a few other showers again tomorrow with a 40% chance for that. And we're going to give that a six on the wasometer. That's our rating from one to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. So here again is that activity in Northwest Georgia tonight falling apart in the morning. This is what's left of that system in the Midwest sweeping through and that's going to fall apart as it moves our way. Lunchtime tomorrow, mainly dry in the afternoon tomorrow, not widespread rain, but that 40% chance we'll see a few scattered showers around. A couple of those could turn strong as well. That dies out and then again on Wednesday, we'll repeat it. This model not showing a lot of rain on uh, Wednesday, but I'm still going with the 40% chance for some of those afternoon showers that may linger into the evening hours. Another quick look in the tropics. Let me show you what we're watching. Here's a system uh, that's out in the middle of the Atlantic that the National Hurricane Hurricane Center is keeping a close eye on. They're giving it about a 60% chance that that could develop into our next tropical storm. The next name on the list is Josephine. And coming up in our next half hour, I'll show you some of the spaghetti model plots with that. Here's a look at your seven day outlook showing that rain chance at 40% Tuesday and Wednesday. Highs still hot in the lower 90s. And then higher rain chances Thursday and Friday at 60%. That will help the um, temperatures come back down into the upper 80s and then a 40% chance for showers Saturday, 30% Sunday, even lower Monday, but temperatures back up into the lower 90s. Take a look at your weather wow moment for today. We had a lot of videos, pictures coming in today from our 11 Alive Community Storm Trackers. This is a video from Stephanie Bush at Lake Lanier showing the really heavy rain and the strong winds that were coming in with those storms earlier today. Stephanie is one of our 11 Alive Community Storm Trackers. You can be one too. On Facebook, just search 11 Alive Storm Trackers. Find that group, ask to become a member, and we'll let you in and you can also see what other storm trackers are sharing and you can share your own weather information there too. Still ahead tonight, if college students decide to live on campus this fall, they're going to need to pack some extra supplies. We'll break down the list next. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit CDC.gov. 
Students leaving for college have a few extra items to pack this year to help combat the coronavirus. Experts say in addition to the essentials, students should only bring what they need for the first few months of school. Dan Shinneman has the details. As college students head to campus this fall, there are new essential items that need to be added to those packing lists. Which is a whole different perspective with the pandemic. Bloggers Anne-Marie Cristiano and Ann Zirkel of Simply Two Moms help families navigate these uncharted waters. You want to have a bag that's already sort of pre-packed that you can grab and get. Melanie Berlier of the Spruce.com echoes the suggestion of a COVID go bag. You want to include a extra cleaning supplies, hand sanitizer, a thermometer, additional face masks, and rubber gloves. And a second bag for items that can't be packed in advance. Like your laptop, your laptop charger, your phone charger, toothbrush, <laughs> toiletries, right. those kinds of things. Yeah. Experts say pack extra of the essentials. You can't rely on being able to pick up whatever you want at a moment's notice these days. If your student buys items online, check where they are delivered to avoid carrying heavy boxes across campus. Every college campus is different about where they um, get their packages delivered. And make sure your student is prepared with a list of emergency contact numbers. Print it out, laminate it, put it on a card, pin it to your wall, do what you have to do. Don't forget the basics, like a good set of sheets, towels, bathrobe, even a weighted blanket. Decor might need to take a back seat this semester. This is the year to pair down a little. Just in case the semester is cut short by the coronavirus. Ah, uh, the old college dorm piece. Yeah. The goal is in your career not to be voicing the old college dorm piece at some point. <laughs> it was the best time of my life. I hope oh, they still it? find enjoyment on move-in day. Yeah, Jeff. All right, time for me to head out to get ready for Up Late coming up in about 35 minutes on 11 Alive. So I'll my, see you there. My parents dropped me off from Pueblo, Colorado. I go to the dorm. I open the door. And there is my new roommate, shirtless, oh. with the biggest bong you've ever seen oh, in your life. That was fun. <laughs> that was fun. I'll tell you my wow. story. I can't tell you mine on air. <laughs> Welcome to adulthood for me. That guy didn't make it past this first semester. So. I bet. I, bet. I, I did, though. Anyway, thank Congrats. you, Aisha. <laughs> Coming up on the Big 36, after the break, our Y guy explains why some kids have such a hard time when it comes to wearing a mask and what parents can do to help nose and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. 
Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. President Trump receiving criticism tonight from Democrats after a series of executive orders addressing the country's economic crisis. The orders include a new weekly unemployment bonus payment of $400. That's less than the 600 that people were initially receiving. Another major highlight, a suspension of payroll taxes for people making less than $100,000 a year. The deferred tax would still be owed next year unless Congress agrees to waive it. That tax money funds Social Security and Medicare. But the president promises this will not impact Social Security. Democrats in Congress are criticizing the president's negotiators after talks of another relief bill fell apart last week. We said to the president, uh, to the president's negotiators uh, last week, we'll meet you in the middle. Right. We'll cut a trillion, you raise a trillion. You know what they said? Absolutely not. I said to them, you mean it's your way or the highway? And they said, yep. Yeah. Since the economic crisis began, we have turned to financial analyst Andrew Poulos to answer your questions, to get an idea about what all of these changes may mean for you. We asked him whether the president has the power to make these moves. The president has the National Emergencies Act, which gives him a roughly about 136 statutory powers where he can sidestep Congress on this. Uh, I personally think the con that the president has uh, pulled a political move here to get Congress to act and do something. Uh, if you notice that the unemployment benefits and everything under this executive order is to begin in September. So we're in second week of August, I think, between now and the end of August. I think the president's using this as a strategy to be able to get both Republicans and Democrats in Congress to act and do something for the American people. We also asked him about this unemployment benefit boost of $400 per week. A $400 chunk of that is supposed to come from the states. Mr. Polis says this may not be a long-term solution. Yeah, well, we're seeing a lot of states who are uh, having budget issues, uh, budget constraints. Um, so I don't think that as it stands now, this is more what the president has done, if it uh, works, is going to be more of a Band-Aid, not a permanent solution. A permanent solution and permanent law is going to have to come from Congress, so they're going to have to act. Uh, there's roughly about somewhere 44 to $50 billion uh, allocated for this extension of the unemployment at the $400 a week rate, which is not going to last for probably more than a few weeks. The other executive orders include an effort to halt evictions and to, uh, to uh, suspend student loans. President Trump says he is open with more talks with Democrats. The unemployment rate for African Americans is stuck at a staggering 14.6 percent, much higher than the overall rate. And one Atlanta mother still trying to figure out how to make ends meet during the pandemic. Here's NBC Steve Patterson, who spoke with her. Every day, Kenesha Mayweather inches closer to her breaking point. The only currency she has in abundance right now, faith. I do a lot of praying. I, I think about my kids. They need me. I've broke down plenty of nights thinking, what am I going to do? We first profiled Mayweather back in June when black Americans were facing their highest unemployment rate in a decade. Mayweather, who lives in Atlanta, felt forced to quit her job in April, afraid of exposing her three children to COVID. I feel sad because I can't provide for my kids like I normally would. Mayweather's eldest daughter diagnosed with a rare form of cancer, her youngest breathing problems. If I don't have to take them out, I will not take them out. 
And just last week, another devastating blow. Right now, I just received the email that I was getting my last check. That additional $600 the federal government had given to unemployed Americans like Mayweather, gone. Don't know how I'm going to continue to pay my bills. I'm going to have to borrow, I guess, and hopefully everything gets paid. 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks, and ever since NBC Nightly News first shared the story, we've been flooded with emails asking how to support the Mayweather family. There was a GoFundMe that you can donate to. The family was only asking for about $2,000 to pay their bills, but as of today, the community stepped up more than $13,000. Let's see if we can get that number even higher. Because of the coronavirus pandemic, many are looking to vote by mail in the upcoming election. November 3rd is quickly approaching, and Francis Abbey put together some tips on how to vote by mail and make it count. Want to vote by mail? Here's what you need to know. Most states are looking to make it easier to vote by mail this year due to the coronavirus. There are currently five states that conduct all elections by mail, Colorado, Hawaii, Oregon, Washington, and Utah. For these elections, all registered voters receive a ballot in the mail. The voter marks the ballot, puts it in a secrecy envelope, and then into a separate mailing envelope. They sign an affidavit on the outside of the mailing envelope and either mail it in or drop it off. If you don't live in one of these states, you can go to vote.org, which will help guide you through the process. Here are five tips to get you started. First, make sure you're registered to vote. Not sure? You can check if and where you're registered on vote.org. If you're not registered, you can register there. Next, if you want to guarantee your vote by mail, request a mail-in ballot. Now, every state's rules are different, so vote.org can guide you to your state's website. Deadlines for mail-in ballots to be returned also vary by state, and they vary a lot. Some states need to receive your ballots by election day. In other states, your ballot needs to be postmarked by election day. So make sure to check your state on vote.org. You should request your mail-in ballot well before election day. The Postal Service recommends 15 days round trip to receive it and send it back. Some states are reporting delays with the Postal Service, so the earlier, the better. Finally, you have the right to vote. If anyone tries to stop you, call the Election Protection Hotline at 1-866-687-8683. The COVID-19 pandemic has made a mask a part of our wardrobe. As children go back to school, many have struggled with it, but they don't want to wear them. What can parents do? Here's our why guy. Halloween is an occasion when you expect to see children in masks. You don't expect it day after day. For many youngsters, a face covering can be far more than just uncomfortable. A lot of children are afraid of masks. Let's explore why young children have difficulty with masks and what parents can do to help. Adults can find masks uncomfortable, but we understand the need in the COVID-19 era. Dr. Joanna Dolgoff is a pediatrician who says children can't make that leap. Children cognitively can't understand the importance of wearing a mask. It doesn't feel good, it's uncomfortable, they can't breathe, it's claustrophobic. That's all they know. They don't like it and they want it off. Youngsters rely on a smile or a familiar face to feel safe. When that's covered, they can grow uneasy. They're actually scared of them, but there are things that we can do as parents to help them get over this fear. For example, both you and your child wearing masks together while in front of a mirror. You can also put a mask on your child's favorite stuffed animal, or you can draw in a mask on your child's favorite storybook character. Introduce the mask slowly. Practice, practice, practice with your child. Sit with them in the mask for a few minutes. The next day, sit a few minutes longer. Dr. Dolgoff says some children will take to them right away. Others need more time to understand we live in an era when masks are not just for Halloween. Question for Jerry Carnes, our Why Guy, send it to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email. New Zealand celebrating 100 days since it stamped out the spread of coronavirus. Hard to believe. New Zealand got rid of the virus by imposing a strict lockdown in late March, but only about 100 people had tested positive for the virus. That stopped its spread. The country has managed to keep its unemployment rate at just 4%. Total infections were limited to just over 1,500, and the country has had only 22 deaths. Airports may have fewer passengers these days, but according to the TSA, 
They're finding a lot more guns at checkpoints, three times as many as last year. Agents say they're finding the firearms, most of them loaded in carry-on bags, more than 15 for every 1 million passengers last month. Compare that to July of 2019. TSA said they found just over five firearms per million. Firearms are prohibited at airports and in airplane passenger cabins. Unloaded firearms packed separately from ammunition must be checked. A Georgia family is demanding answers after a police officer fired shots at a car with children inside on Saturday in South Georgia. The GBI is investigating what happened during a chaotic traffic stop, which has now gained the attention of the Georgia NAACP. Here's Blaine Alexander. This, what they saw that, bro. this video shows the chaotic aftermath of a confrontation between South Georgia police and a car full of minors. They're shooting at them. For what? You know the kids. You see the kids and you still shooting? State officials are investigating what led up to an officer firing repeatedly at the vehicle. These are kids. These are minors. According to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, a Waycross police officer tried to get license plate information on the car. Three minors, ages 9, 12, and 14, got out and ran. When a second officer came to help, the GBI says the car drove toward that officer who started shooting. My little sister's going to be remembered running from the police and falling in the grass of her own yard and almost getting shot. Inside the car, a 15- and 16-year-old, both facing charges, including driving without a license, aggravated assault on an officer, and both charged with weapons possession. Their father told a local station the gun was in the glove compartment and registered to their mother. Those are the children, man! Now the local NAACP is demanding release of the police body camera and dash cam video. The most concerning aspect is a 9-year-old and a 12-year-old were subject to having guns fired in their presence or around them. Uh, and so our concern is the level of force that was used. The GBI says no officers were injured and two have been placed on administrative leave. So far, the GBI has investigated 59 officer-involved shootings in Georgia this year, including four this weekend alone. With the United States passing 5 million COVID-19 cases, new research shining a light on the window in which people can spread the virus and how dangerous that can be for large gatherings. We had one round of showers and storms move through earlier today. That's out of here. Now another area we're watching in North Alabama and even more in the Midwest. I'll let you know if any of those will impact us tonight. Up next in sports, college football players speaking out. We will hear about their efforts to try and save the football season. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station.
today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage. During the United States has surpassed 5 million cases of COVID-19. That's more than any other country in the world by far. Now new research is shining a light on how massive gatherings can contribute to the spread. Here's NBC's Gabe Gutierrez. This morning, growing concern over potential super spreading events, which may be fueling a dramatic spike in coronavirus cases. <laughs> Tensions boiling over outside a church in Ventura County, California, where pro mass demonstrators had gathered. Godspeed Calvary Chapel defying statewide orders with indoor services. Now you get a chance to greet one another, uh, you know, however you like. There's freedom. Say hello. In Sturgis, South Dakota, a 10 day motorcycle rally that's expected to draw up to a quarter million people is still underway. All the other bike shows have been canceled nationwide. No mass required. To me, uh, a, a little bit frightening. Dr. Joshua Schiffer is with the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. He and his colleagues published a paper that's not been peer reviewed, but it found that coronavirus super spreading events are the result of the right people at the wrong place at the wrong time. 10 to 20 percent of people are responsible for about 80 percent of the infections. Then there are these less common but extremely important events where one person can infect dozens of sometimes over a hundred people. According to a model his team built, the riskiest window for transmission may be very brief, just a one or two day period in the week after a person is infected. But that window could be a huge problem if the person happens to be surrounded by crowds. The most obvious thing is you would try to prevent an unnecessary congregation of people in a tight environment. With the U.S. topping 5 million cases, these five states combined now make up more than 40% of the infections. In Chicago, beaches remain closed, but dozens gathered on one over the weekend anyway. You know, that picture was, I think, horrifying to many people uh, standing here. Researchers are now saying the virus can still spread outside of that short window. Dr. Schiffer says people shouldn't let up on wearing masks and social distancing, but the longer an infection drags on, the less likely a person is to be contagious. Watching those storms in North Alabama, and as expected, the stronger part of that is staying over in Alabama. But there are just a few showers coming into a date in Walker County and into Chattooga County. Floyd County, you might get in on a little bit of that, but that all the heaviest stuff is staying over in Alabama. You can see all that thunder and lightning in the northern part. And we were telling you that, you know, here in Georgia, our air is a lot more stable, and we are expecting those stronger storms to stay over to the west of us. And that's what's happening right now. There's yet another system that we're watching. This has been a big time wind event over a big part of the upper Midwest today. It is a little bit weaker. We no longer have any strong or severe thunderstorm warnings in association with this, but we are going to be watching this part of the storms is trying to uh, sag down to the south. It is possible that early tomorrow morning, a couple of those showers with this system before it all falls apart may make it into northwest Georgia again. 
uh, you know, during those early morning hours tomorrow. It was really hot today. We got up to 95 degrees. That was before the rain came in. Then the rain came in that dropped us into the 70s this afternoon, and then we've been in the 70s ever since. Our average high for this time of year is 89, and the rain that came through that cooled us down, we only got about 1800. It's less than a quarter of an inch of rain today. That surplus still just a little bit more than 10 inches above where we should be in rainfall for the year. So here's a look at your weather headlines. We're in an unsettled pattern this week. You know, we have the heat, we have the humidity, but also some other little disturbances are going to move through that will enhance our chances for some of those afternoon storms that'll be with us. And it's still going to be hot with temperatures in the 90s the next couple of days, but we do think when the rain chance goes up a little bit more on your Thursday and Friday that the uh, high temperatures in the afternoon will hold into the upper 80s. So here's a look at the wasometer number for your Tuesday. This is our rating from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. We're going to go with a 6, starting off at 72 in the morning, a high of 92 in the afternoon, scattered showers, a few thunderstorms in those afternoon hours, and there's a chance that some of those could be strong. So here's what we're watching with the forecast track. Dry weather out there tonight. Here is what is left of that system in the Midwest that may come in early tomorrow morning, falling apart as it gets closer to Atlanta. Chesley will be in with you early tomorrow morning, kind of tracking that system as it gets closer to us. At noontime, we're still dry. Then in the afternoon hour here, uh, hours on Tuesday, scattered showers are going to be redeveloping with that rain chance at about 40%. And then in the uh, afternoon, again on Wednesday, we'll be watching a few scattered showers that can move our way as well. Earlier, we told you about the tropics, how we're watching that system out in the middle of the Atlantic where the National Hurricane Center, giving this a 60% chance of development. Here's a look at the spaghetti model plots as that moves across the Atlantic and you know at, after this gets today five to seven that's when the models start diverging a little bit we'll keep an eye on this to see if it would have any impact on the US Virgin Islands or in Puerto Rico too early to tell if it's going to make it to the US mainland there and impact the southeast or the Atlantic coast or even the Gulf of Mexico but we'll keep an eye on that too 92 for a high Tuesday and Wednesday 93 on uh, uh, Wednesday with a 40% chance for showers 60% chance for showers Thursday and Friday with highs we think we'll hold in the upper 80s with those higher rain chances and then back to 40% Saturday, lower rain chances Sunday, and then even lower chances on Monday with highs in the lower 90s. Soon college presidents across America will have to make a decision about fall sports. Right now, the future of the game, we don't know where it stands right now. Many players are making their voices heard. Here's Alex Glaze with the story tonight. We want to play. As the 2020 fall college football season hangs in the balance, Clemson quarterback Trevor Lawrence ended a tweet with those four words Sunday night, and it quickly transformed into a movement. It's great to see somebody stand up and lead on behalf of the student athletes. And seeing Trevor Lawrence, who's probably one of, if not the best college football player in America, to stand up and really rally the troops and say, guys, listen to what we're saying. We're the ones who are playing the game and we want to play later in a tweet lawrence posted a statement attributed to representatives of the players of the power five conferences calling on the conferences to take certain actions to make football this fall feasible most notably the players called for a college football players association we're talking about players becoming employees right and, and so there's a lot of kind of unintended consequences that come with that but i think if it's led by smart people the right people um you know, people that understand kind of how collegiate finances work and, and, and what you're what you're getting into if you decide to unionize, then yeah, I think it could work. President Trump quote tweeted Lawrence's post and added, the student athletes have been working too hard for their season to be canceled. Hashtag we want to play. We're counting down to the Atlanta Sports Awards happening right on eleven alive coming up on Saturday. During the big broadcast, Hawks president Steve Coonan, that man right there will receive the Lifetime Achievement Award. He has had a great career with stops at Coca-Cola and Turner Entertainment, and now the Hawks. Here's a sneak peek at what you can expect. The Lifetime Achievement Award, presented by Coca-Cola. It's a real honor to be this year's Atlanta Sports Council Lifetime Achievement Award winner. When I look at the list of past recipients, I don't look at them as colleagues or peers. I look at them as heroes of mine. I never dreamed growing up in Atlanta that I would be able to lead two of Ted's businesses, the Atlanta Hawks and Turner Entertainment Networks. This is a town where anything can happen. I'm living proof. See the heroes who've come out of here from Martin Luther King and Jimmy Carter. No idea, no dream is too big for Atlanta. 
Atlanta can do it all. I believe sports unite more than any policy or politician. Great marketing and great community and great teams could build lifelong fans. And we redid State Farm Arena to hold up a mirror to our great city. We built courts all over Atlanta to allow kids to play. We have big plans to work with entrepreneurs to create much more economic opportunity in the black community. We can work together and we will work together and we'll, the Hawks are more than happy to step up and stand out. All right, the big show's on Saturday. We hope you'll be able to join us on 11 Alive. That is it for us for now. We'll take a break. We'll come back, talk a little weather with Chris and wrap things up. Stay with us. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. We have a 40% chance for showers here Tuesday and Wednesday, mainly the afternoon and evening variety. Still going to be hot, 92 for a high Tuesday, 93 on Wednesday. And then Thursday and Friday, the rain chances are going to be a little bit higher at 60%. And with those higher rain chances, more clouds, less sun, that means those temperatures will be a little bit lower. We'll see high temperatures in the upper 80s there Thursday and Friday. And then look what happens as we head toward the weekend. The rain chances don't go away, but they do come down a little bit to 40% Saturday, 30% Sunday, highs around 91 Sunday, and then a 20% chance for a shower by Monday with high temperatures right around 91 degrees. All right, that's it for us. Thanks for watching. 11alive.com is your place for all of the news. You can switch to 11 Alive right now for up late. Remember, the news continues all the time online at 11alive.com as we leave you. 
Uh, a nice little shot tonight. Lovely weather evening wherever you go in North Georgia. For Chris and Aisha and the entire team, I'm Jeff Hovinger. Have a good night, everyone. See you tomorrow. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers?